All right, I'm going live, so no noise. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are still letting people in, and uh, we are, uh, as soon as uh, we think we have everybody, we'll get started. So thank you for your patience.
Hi, everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment. I see some folks are sending in where they're zooming in from in the chat. Just in case if folks can't see it, it's really exciting. We've got folks from Talbot County. We have Salisbury in the house, Ocean Pines, as far away from as Philadelphia, but Kent in the island in my heart. I love that. Millington, uh, Washington, D.C., Berlin, Maryland, Annapolis, Cambridge. So cool. Keep dropping it in the chat and we're going to start soon. Hey, folks from Frederick, Baltimore, Kennett Square, Calvert County, Sperna Park. Why Mills, that is a lovely place. All right, we got some more folks from Berlin. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, folks, we are having some technical difficulties, uh, so please bear with us uh, for a few more minutes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. Somerset County is in the house. All right. Over 50 attendees and folks are still rolling in. Wonderful. Hi folks, we'll be on in just a second. Thanks for joining us. And if, you're, if you've just popped on, drop where you're coming, zooming in from in the chat, and we're gonna get started really soon. It's wonderful to see so many advocates and legislators here today. And I wanna thank you all for coming and for your participation in this wonderful two-day event. Okay, I think uh, we'll get started, uh, even though some people are still trying to get in. My name is Susan Olson, and I am the vice chair of the Sierra Club's Lower Eastern Shore Group. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for being here today as we take a look at the environmental legislation being proposed for our 2022 Maryland General Assembly session, which begins this week. Uh, there are two very special people I would like to introduce you to. 
Cecilia Plant, and, uh, and Monica O'Connor of the Maryland Legislative Coalition Climate Justice Wing. Both have labored intensively on this annual environmental summit for the past three years. The amount of work they have put into this event has been truly amazing. Our summit would never have been created and sustained without their expertise and steadfast devotion. The Maryland Legislative Coalition also has a website if you wanna learn more about the group. In addition, the three of us would like to extend our thanks to our very patient and capable Maryland chapter Sierra Club technician, Gary Young. And we also must give a shout out to Shore Rivers, especially to Emily Harris and Ellie Bar Barrett, as well as the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Today, we are going to hear from some of the most respected and dedicated members of our General Assembly. We are so proud of them. In fact, last year, many of the comments from participants were about our delegates and senators. They were impressed with the dedication, wisdom, and devotion to what can be a very difficult job. You know, many people elect legislators and do not think about the legislation these folks work on so, so hard. They probably think we elected a smart, capable delegate or senator, and they do not involve themselves any further, trusting that those elected will carry the weight for all of us. However, our legislators cannot do it alone. It takes a village to get things done. If we have learned anything from the last few years, we know that we must have our participatory citizenry to ensure that even the most basic common sense bills are passed into law. We must support the legislators we voted for. We will be showing slides that provide information about the 26 pieces of legislation we will be discussing this weekend. At the bottom of each slide is the name of the advocacy group representative for the bill and their email address. If you see a bill you would like to support, please contact them. After this summit, we will be sending each of you the PowerPoint slides and the recordings for both days, so you will have the information you need. Each legislator is being given seven minutes for each bill he or she presents. They will reserve some of that time for questions. We will also have a question and answer period at the end of the program on Sunday. Any questions you may have should be written in the Q&A box. We, the chat feature has been disabled so that it can be used by the panelists. We truly appreciate all of you who are participating here today and thank you for coming. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ellie Bassett from Shore Rivers. Ellie is the river keeper for both the Miles and Y rivers, as well as the Eastern Bay. She is involved in Shore Rivers policy and advocacy work, environmental education, oyster restoration, water quality monitoring, and restoration projects. Ellie received a bachelor's degree in environmental studies with a concentration in Chesapeake Regional Studies from Washington College. She also has a master's degree in environmental education. And she previously worked with the Chesapeake Bay Trust and NOAA. Take it from here, Allie. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third annual Eastern Shore Environmental Legislative Preview. Again, my name is Ellie Bassett, your Miles Y Riverkeeper with Shore Rivers. We're an organization dedicated to the restoration and protection of the waterways right here on the Eastern Shore. I have the great pleasure of guiding you through today's agenda and introducing you to the incredible lineup of our legislators that we have joining with us today. When I was asked to MC, I was thrilled because the Miles Y watershed is located in Queen Anne's and Talbot County here on the Eastern Shore. And it represents much of what we're trying to protect through the legislation that you'll hear today. As Riverkeeper, part of my job is doing water quality monitoring. And based off our data, we know that our rivers are not where they could be or where they should be. And here in our office, we have this saying that our rivers are suffering from a thousand cuts and it's gonna take a thousand solutions for us to restore them. Uh, we'll be hearing some of those solutions today. And although we won't be hearing a thousand of them, 
You can see here that we have quite a packed agenda. We're gonna be hearing from over 20 environmental bills on, from our advocates and our legislators. And these are the legislative solutions that are gonna directly impact our water, our climate, and our land. So I can't wait to learn more about them with you. Uh, before I get started, I wanna do a, a bit more housekeeping. Uh, I, if you're not on mute, I'm gonna ask you to mute now. Thank you. Uh, and I will be introducing our legislators first. So legislators, if you have advocates who are joining you, please just announce them so that we can spotlight them. I will also be working the slide deck. So uh, just let me know if you need me to advance or go back. Um, again, just to reiterate, this is day one of two, so make sure you also sign up for the second day to hear even more legislative bills for tomorrow. So let's get started right off the jump here. My first legislator that I'll introduce is Delegate Fisher. She'll be discussing the Environmental Human Rights Amendment. Delegate Fisher serves as the Assistant Majority Leader in the House and serves on the Judiciary Committee, where she works to ensure our communities are safe and criminal justice reform is a priority. She is extremely involved in her local community and is passionate about working towards a cleaner state in which residents can enjoy a healthy life and environment. So it's quite fitting that she is reintroducing the Environmental Human Rights Amendment. Please welcome Delegate Fisher. Thank you so much, Ali, and thank you all for being here today. I'm gonna have um, Rosa Hans also join me as part of um, my uh, discussion on the bill. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. I'm uh, Winika Fisher. I represent uh, District 47B and that is the gorgeous Prince George's County. I am uh, the most northern part of Prince George's County and I abut uh, Montgomery County. So it's um, it's a wonderful place. Um, there is uh, There are issues, which is why we're here to talk about the bills to solve those issues. Um, the environmental rights um, amendment is a really important piece of legislation. This will be the third time it's introduced <clears throat> in, the, in uh, the Maryland General Assembly. And the purpose of this bill is to establish rights articulated in the Environmental Policy Act, which is chapter 702 um, of 1973, actually, in our, and, and put that into our state constitution. The purpose of this amendment, it's that it's gonna grant each and every Marylander an inalienable right to a healthy environment um, and awards the state as a trustee of its natural environment and uh, resources for generations to come. Um, it's really important for us to formalize environmental human as rights as a civil right in our constitution. Um, environmental injustice really hits hard to vulnerable groups. And I can speak personally uh, for myself and for my district um, and how those vulnerable communities, whether they're, whether they're low income or communities of color, um, are disproportionately the subject to environmental pollution. And one of those examples um, that I wanted to talk a little bit about today um, was in, is in my home district. Um, in District 47, uh, we deal a lot with air quality issues with batching plants um, that has been uh, the source of, of much turmoil uh, for, for decades. And if you just put in um, batching plants, Prince George's County, um, it will come up. And a lot of that in our district in bordering DC in the early days was a more industrial space and was not as residential as it is today. Um, but the air quality and the health outcomes for communities of color are disproportionately seen. This bill will allow, um, whether it's individuals or in a class action fashion to actually pursue a lawsuit based on the fact that um, an enable right uh, to a healthy env environment would be in our state constitution. There was a wave of these um, types of legislation uh, that came in um, in the 70s. Pennsylvania, our neighboring state has this in their state constitution, but it's resurged um, in the last several years. Uh, and the great state of New York, uh, my, my birth state, actually just passed this um, same legislation in their um, last assembly. So states are really stepping up uh, to the call um, to make sure our citizens are protected in our, in the, in our constitutions um, in this way. And um, Maryland should be the next state uh, to do the same. In general, in addition, I'm sorry, um, this legislation also allows when it comes to agencies, local governments, um, a, new a new direction and a real highlight on um, people's enable right to a healthy environment and to keep that in mind. Um, when things are happening, when governments are making decisions, when regulation is formed, um, it helps to mitigate impacts and helps to promote conversations uh, when it comes to environmental actors on the early end rather than after 
um, when harm has been done and increases public health. Um, there are individuals out there that would say that this legislation is going to lead to a floodgate of lawsuits. Um, but as a lawyer outside of my uh, public service life, I will tell you, um, bringing lawsuits costs money. And especially when it comes to um, environmental infractions, the kind of expert testimony you're going to need, it really is going to be um, there and litigated for things that are really hurting communities to come together to pursue it in our court system. Other states that ha also have um, a similar um, environmental human rights amendment in their state constitutions have not seen um, a floodgate of litigation that's going to clog up our court system. Our court system is is more than um, able and ready to handle um, handle uh, cases such as these. Um, there is literally no right guaranteed when it comes to our environment, and we know um, that none of us, no matter what what our passions are, whatever we're pursuing, uh, we can't go forward as a state without a healthy environment. Um, so I'm really excited um, to bring this legislation back. Um, I'm going to uh, stop there. I don't wanna just uh, be talking at everyone in the Zoom. Um, I'm gonna let Rosa talk a little bit about our advocacy efforts on this legislation to try to get it over the finish line. And um, the other thing I wanted to add about this piece of legislation is once it's passed, it's a constitutional amendment. So it'll actually be on your ballot for Marylanders to make that decision in November. Um, so I think it's so important and I think Marylanders will come out and say that they want to write uh, to a healthy environment. Uh, so with that, I'll let Rosa take over when it comes to our advocacy on this and I'll leave it my, the rest of my time open for questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, um, that's a wonderful overview. And thank you so much for sponsoring this bill. Um, you know, it's Delegate Fisher, it's so exciting to be here with you today and to uh, be here with all of the attendees here. And I'm really delighted to be here on behalf of the advocacy community that's surrounding the Maryland Campaign for Environmental Human Rights. Um, I'm Rosa Hans. I'm the chair of the Maryland Sierra Club, and we are just one of a huge coalition of groups ranging from environmental to social justice, civil rights organizations, public health organizations, faith organizations, um, and, and, and it's a growing, um, a growing coalition. And so I just wanted to um, compliment those, the thoughts that Delegate Fisher has shared here and, um, and tell folks that if you, are, if you are interested in this bill so far, there is so much that you can do to get involved and to show your support. So first of all, if you haven't seen it yet and signed it yet, um, please sign and, and share the petition. Right now, both Sierra Club, and the Maryland Campaign for Environmental Human Rights both have petitions going. So we're collecting signatures from any angle. And, and of course, we encourage you to reach out and contact your local legislator and your delegates um, and state senators and tell them that you want to see this passed. Um, because it's an amendment, it's um, not only do we need it to pass out of the Maryland General Assembly, but we need um, it to vote, get voted in on the ballot as, as Delegate Fisher shared. So it's important that every voter know about this and even voters uh, for the future because they're the ones whose lives are gonna be impacted by um, whether we have an environment that is worthy of passing down to our children and grandchildren. So I will, um, I'll share that petition in the chat if you haven't seen it already. And if you have any organizations that you are a part of in other parts of your uh, life or your community organization or church or um, temple, synagogue, mosque, um, you know, any, any organizations that you are a part of, we would really, really be excited to welcome you into this coalition of organizations. And we hope that you and, and you know, you and your neighbors, right, even if you're um, there virtually with us, um, we are excited to be able to rally together. Um, and we will be rallying on a, on a launch um, event this coming Friday, January 14th is a great time to uh, take a lunch break, uh, join the rally, you'll hear much more about it because I know we have so many things to get to today. Um, so um, I'll leave you with the, um, the information in the chat and um, while we don't yet have the 2022 session bill numbers for this, uh, for this bill yet, 
um, when you join, uh, when you sign on the petitions, you'll kind of, you'll start getting more regular updates. So you'll find out up to the minute. And then um, by the time February comes around, um, we have a lobby night that we do every year. And I really encourage every single person here to join us. It's a wonderful opportunity to meet one-on-one uh, -on -one with your delegates and state senators. Um, we have a training for it on February 4th and meeting with a legislator, your legislators on February 7th and that, that week if we don't get them all on the same day. So um, uh, please sign up via www.mdlobbyweek.com. And um, thank you so much for being here. And I'll, I'll let uh, the next um, folks jump on the line here. Thank you, Rosa. De Thank you, Delegate Fisher. Um, uh, you know, we all know that this is a no brainer and it should be happening. I'm looking forward to, to seeing it come back. We did get a question come through and it, we're already but running behind. So I'm gonna keep moving here and hopefully we have time at the end, but if not, I'll be sure to follow up with Delegate Fisher and make sure those questions get to you so that you can follow up with, with those asking the questions. Next up, we have Delegate Sharkudian. So she will be speaking on a number of environmental bills today. And since joining the House in 2019, she has truly made her mark on the General Assembly and has become an environmental leader on climate policy in Maryland. In fact, she ran a very cool green campaign to give concrete evidence of her commitment to climate change action, taking actions such as eliminating campaign swag, including plastic items and balloons, and locating campaign events to be accessible by public, public transport, among many others a great environmental role model. It's no surprise that she has a number of environmental bills that she's bringing to the session this year. So please welcome Delegate Sharkudian. Thank you. It is an absolute honor to be here. And I'm sorry that I have to present in this way, which is that I'll be presenting five bills and then leaving actually. And uh, the advocates will present after that. Um, and it's because I have another event I'm supposed to be speaking at in person that's starting right now. Um, I will drive safely and carefully. Uh, but let me just briefly say that the reason I'm sorry about that is because I value so deeply the work of this coalition and everyone who's on here. And because we know so clearly now um, that not only are we at a crucial point in our the history of this planet in terms of our potential to save ourselves from catastrophe, but also that it is people's movements that ultimately make that a reality. And so your work, the work of everyone on this call is what's gonna make that a reality. And so thank you for that. We desperately need your help in Annapolis. Look forward to seeing you. And with that, I'll just briefly go over each of the bills this first one here, I think third time's a charm. It's the third time we've brought this back. I see Ruth Ann Norton from Green and Healthy Homes. We've had a great coalition on this one, but it's been a tough one to get through. This bill does a number of things. The most important is that it sets a standard and holds the Department of Housing and Community Development accountable for energy efficiency improvements in low-income housing. We've done okay, pretty good on efficiency upgrades across the um, sort of on average housing across this this, this state, um, but when you pull out low-income housing, it is shameful how the disparity in our investments in low-income housing. Of course, when we do the energy efficiency upgrades, part of what this bill does is it streamlines and creates a one-stop shop for uh, federal money, state money for, for not only efficiency, but also um, safe indoor air quality issues, safety issues, health issues. And so um, there's not a better bang for our buck in terms of investment, both in environmental outcomes as well as injustice and health and safety. And so hopefully this is the year that we get this through and we really uh, look forward to your help on this one. And we can switch to the next slide. If you would. Um, the Grid Reliability and Inclusive Distribution Act. It is my goal that by the end of hopefully today, but certainly within the first few weeks of session, um, all of the environmentalists in this state fully appreciate what a sexy and wildly exciting thing the distribution grid is. Okay, so this is the poles, the wires, the technology, the substations, and it's something we don't pay a lot of attention to. So we've done a lot of great work adding community solar, adding efficiency requirements. We've done great work adding DERs and solar uh, standards. But what we haven't done is said, wait a second, what are the utilities actually doing with the grid? And if the utilities aren't doing the work on the grid to be able to essentially take in 
all of that distributed energy, to be able to do bi-directional charging so that our hot water heaters and our cars can charge the grid during peak periods and shut down the peaker plants that are fossil fuel plants. If the utilities aren't doing that work now, planning for it now and implementing those changes over the next few years, then we're not gonna meet all the other goals that we have for EV charging, for, um, for bi-directional charging, for distributed energy, for microgrids, for resiliency. And so this bill really creates the framework and requires the utilities to engage and the Public Service Commission to monitor to make sure that our grid um, is doing everything we need it to do so all of the other uh, goals and standards and strategies and policies we have can become a reality. Um, next slide, please. Um, is this okay farm to food security so um food justice is uh, an incredible place to do work i know many of you do this food justice work as we know our food system is completely upside down and backwards um the current design is bad for our environment for our health it doesn't prepare us for emergencies as we learned over the last few years it's bad for our local economies it's bad for our bay um, and we have the ability by changing our food systems uh, to really address all of those things, to address environmental sustainability, to address farmland preservation, to address equity, to address health, um, and to address emergency preparedness. And this bill gets on a couple of pieces, gets at a couple of pieces that we had a chance to experiment with over the last few years and really tries to push them forward. So one is it increases the money that is available for doubling federal nutrition benefits at farmers markets. That's Maryland market money. Um, what, this, what that does is it makes healthy food available to folks using their uh, SNAP benefits. It brings more money into farmers pockets, both the SNAP money as well as the, 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 uh, the supplemental money. And it makes farmers markets financially viable in places that would otherwise be food deserts. Um, the second thing that this bill does is it pilots a, a, a model of adding additional money to school lunch reimbursements if the, if the lunches contain, or meals contain local content, locally grown food. Uh, it's a model that's worked in Michigan and New York and DC to really move the needle much more than we've done so far in the state on bringing real local fresh food into school lunches, uh, school meals. And finally, the last one uh, creates a grant so that all of our food uh, emergency food distribution partners who've done such incredible work keeping our communities fed over the last several uh, this this crisis period and beyond before um, for them to be able to purchase and contract with local farmers. Um, right now, a lot of those systems that support emergency food distributions bring food in from uh, across the country. And while it's important to be meeting the emergency need, it's important to do that in a way that's also building the sustainability of our local agricultural system. Um, and so we have uh, extraordinary advocates from the Capital Area Food Bank who will be speaking about that after I go through all of these. Next slide, please. Um, the third one, um, fourth one, where are we? I'm not sure which one we're on, but this is another good one. You know, they say you're not supposed to fall in love with your bills. Like it's, that's like the advice they give to, to new, le new legislators. And I got to say, I fall deeply and madly in love with every single one of my bills. And it's a real problem because here's another one that I'm in love with. So last year, folks on this call, many of you, um, uh, got, uh, worked really hard to get through the organics waste ban bill. And so that passed last year, it's in the reg process right now. And we hope that'll really move the needle on the large waste generators and on developing more both centralized as well as distributed um, opportunities for compost. This bill responds to some uh, really inspiring students that I've worked with in Montgomery County and then been connected to others around the state who are really pushing their local school to um, do more uh, on the food rescue side of things, really diversion, rescue, diversion, um, you know, food security, as well as the compost uh, side of it. So really pulling uh, lunch out of landfills as our, our advocate is, uh, is organization is, is from and, and we'll be speaking about. So this creates a grant program for school systems um, to pilot. And what we find is when school systems are able to pilot, measure, see the, the simplicity of it and see how well it's really impressive. I was visiting a, a, a local school um, and the program had been in place for a week and I had five, I had uh, five-year-olds, you know, sorting their lunches. They know how to do it. It's the adults who struggle with it. Five-year-olds sorting the lunch trash uh, and, and from compost. And then I had fifth graders explaining to me about uh, methane emissions in landfill and why it was so important for them to get the food out of the landfills um, and also explaining healthy soils to me. It was amazing. That was after a week. So really what this can do both on 
on the education side. And then the hope is that once we have uh, these pilot opportunities in place through a grant program, that school systems will then uh, be able to see how much this saves out of their regular um, regular disposal mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. um, and really build this into their budgets long term, is, which is what we need to have happen. Um, next slide, please. And facilitates the so finally, um, I think that someone, uh, Ruth, can you mute yourself, please? Um, thank you. Um, so the last one uh, is uh, the Electric Universal Service Program. Is this? It's it's the state's program. It's under state control um, that pays for utility assistance. And when the state designed this program uh, a number of years back, it was designed to be universally accessible. But because the Department of Human Services has made the application process for EUSP the exact same as the application process for LIHEAP, MEEP, which is federal money, heating assistance money, the federal money requires that you have social security numbers. So it requires in the application, basically it goes to folks who are documented in this illegal, have legal residence in this, in this state. And so while EUSP was designed to be available to everybody because of the way DHS has implemented it, it has excluded EUSP from undocumented residents, uh, although that was never the, the legislative intent. Uh, we've done advocacy with the Department of Human Services, asking them to separate that out, to make a pathway for everybody to be able to apply for EUSP. Um, they've chosen not to do that. And so this bill will require that they create that separate pathway uh, so that every Everybody uh, will be able to access the USB funds. And it's important to note that everyone pays into these funds. These are surcharges on our electric bills, um, as well as some um, Reggie money uh, goes into this, this pot of money. So this will um, really help people keep the heat and lights on um, who are really struggling right now and, 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 and on an ongoing basis. Um, and I think that's my five. Is there another slide after this that I'm supposed to speak to? I apologize. Good. Nope, this is your final slide. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. I really a thank you again. And I know the advocates who are going to pick it up from here will do a fantastic job. And thanks for your flexibility with my schedule. Thank you all. And thanks, Laura, uh, so much. And I'm Ruth Ann Norton. I'm with the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Uh, and uh, we work to address the social determinants of health and racial equity through healthier climate friendly housing. The bill that Delegate Charcutian uh, raised uh, in the first year we got cut short on our hearing by uh, COVID. So I will say this is really the second full time we've had a, a shot at getting this done, really looks to uh, create some common sense here. In Maryland, there is an imbalance between what low income communities and families contribute uh, to empower and other energy uh, funds and uh, it, versus what we invest back in them. The Marylanders with the highest energy burden in the state get the least amount of benefit from customer funded energy efficiency programs. And that's a problem because that undermines wealth retention, it undermines equity, it undermines health. What this bill will do is write that help to set an outcomes target uh, of 1% energy savings um, and it, across Maryland, not only in urban uh, and more dense communities, but throughout in our rural communities where one in five families are part of this uh, cohort of families paying 550% more as a portion of their income for energy. And yet we're not investing in ways to do energy efficiency, weatherization, decarbonization, and electrification that would lower this. But what this bill also does is so smart. It creates the platform and the conduit for us to align, grade, and coordinate other resources so that the taxpayer and this government is getting a better, more effective and efficient outcome from the federal, state, and local resources that are put into home energy auditing, uh, lowering energy consumption and bills, and improving health, housing stability, and outcomes. So we are reaching out across this cross-sector community 
where now if you look at the investments being made by hospitals, by Medicaid managed care plans, when they're investing in the social determinants of health, they're investing in part in energy efficiency and weatherization because it has such a dramatic impact on respiratory health, on cardiac health. But this is also really important to invest in communities that have had extraordinarily disenfranchisement and disinvestment, have high energy burden, and help to lead advancements on climate in smart ways uh, through investing in those communities. And this will benefit families regardless of the energy source uh, that is going into their home to better and more effectively uh, lead that. So we're gonna be doing a number of different uh, convenings of leaders around health, housing, energy, and climate. We are, uh, would be happy to answer questions on this. We think it is a smart bill. It follows the trend of other states uh, that are setting out uh, more defined investments in low and moderate income housing. So I wanna make sure we give time to everyone here, but I'm here to answer questions. I think this is really critical if we wanna talk about equity and we wanna talk about good government, this is a great bill to do that. Hi everybody, my name is Victoria. I am here um, representing Chesapeake Climate Action Network as their Maryland director. I'm not going to take up too much time because I think Delegate Charcutian, as always, did a wonderful job putting this into context. Um, but I did want to stress a really important piece of this legislation, which is that it helps our state harness the opportunities that we have coming forward because of federal funds. So I've actually dropped a um, fact sheet in the chat if you would like to uh, take a look at that. It provides a little bit more information about this legislation. and and specifically what it does as it pertains to ensuring that there's equity, ensuring that our goals are well represented in this planning process, and making sure that at the end of the day, the planning process that's, under, that's being under um, gone with the Public Service Commission is actually working towards the, the state goals as they uh, relate to decarbonization, greenhouse gas reduction, renewable energy uh, uh, implementation, and and most importantly, that we do this in a forward thinking way so that we are able to build an energy future that is sustainable and works for all Marylanders. Um, as I said, we actually will be getting some significant funding from the federal government um, because of the bipartisan infrastructure package. And this bill uh, helps direct the state of Maryland on how to utilize those funds, really harness the opportunity we have at this moment. Um, Many of you probably know this, but we have uh, we are in a pivotal moment when it comes to energy generation and infrastructure. Meaning if we don't act in the next couple of years to modernize and improve our grid and the infrastructure that supports our grid, um, we are going to miss the window of opportunity and we won't be able to really harness uh, the opportunity of the federal funds as well as uh, the growing industry of renewable energy. And um, so that's all what all this, uh, is all about. And so I really hope that you are as excited um, as Delegate Charcutian is about uh, the distribution system. It sounds a little wonky, but what it really comes down to is being able to turn your lights on and, and um, embracing the, the opportunity that the growing technology around renewable energy um, is giving us. We can live in a world where, like she said, your water heater could help charge the grid and vice versa. And that's a really cool and exciting opportunity with that we don't wanna miss out, miss out on. So um, like I said, uh, take a look at the fact sheet. I will also put my contact information in the chat and um, I'll pass it on to the next advocate. Thank you, Victoria. I'm wondering if we have an advocate for this slide. If not, I will continue to move on. Oh, I apologize. I was muted. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. I totally understand the struggle. <laughs> yeah, I, I just Saturday. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Ann Wallace. And I'm the Senior Director of Government Relations with the Maryland Food Bank. Um, and the Maryland Food Bank and the Capital Area Food Bank are the two statewide food banks that serve all of Maryland. Um, we're really excited to talk about this bill. 
Um, this bill is stemming out of recommendations from the Food System Resiliency Council, which was established by legislation last year by Delegate Charcutian. Um, and for us, you know, part, part of the goals of the council as well as the food banks is to create a strong and stable food system statewide. And that's going to allow us to serve food insecure individuals um, in communities all across the state, not just um, where they might be local to farms. So as Delegate Charcutian mentioned, this bill does three things. Um, first, it expands Maryland market money. Um, so it increases currently there's a, a state budget allocation of $100,000 for this program, and this would be increasing that to $300,000 um, to able to allow people to be um, using this money in more farmers markets throughout the state. The second thing that this does is it, as Delia Charcutian mentions, it creates the MD Farm Program. Um, and what this is gonna allow food assistance organizations to do, um, it's a grant program for the purchase, processing, and transportation um, of local Maryland uh, crops and produce from Maryland farms and farmers, which is really exciting. So it's really gonna expand, excuse me, expand the reach um, of what food assistance organizations are able to provide in terms of fresh produce and really strengthen farms and farmers as well um, by allowing this partnership to, uh, to grow. And then the last thing it does is it creates a farm to school grant pilot program. So this is a grant program for schools that's gonna reimburse them 20 cents per every meal that they serve that includes a Maryland based um, crop, uh, specifically produce as well. Um, it's really exciting and it's gonna get, um, it's gonna help some of our child food insecurity um, efforts really, really take shape in the state. And I will attach a one pager as well as the bill numbers in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to Delegate uh, Charcutian's next bill if we have an advocate to speak to this. Yeah, I'm Joe Richardson. I'm calling from Frederick, Maryland. I founded an organization called Lunch Out of Landfills, a nonprofit, back in uh, 2018. And we began to uh, divert waste from several schools in, Fred in Frederick County. Uh, that expanded in 2019 to 2020, the 18 schools, um, some were in, mostly were in Frederick County, but uh, several were in Montgomery County. The pandemic hit, the program went away, schools shut down. Uh, we've been working very diligently uh, this, uh, this uh, summer and fall to reinstitute the program. And where we stand right now is 50% is of, of the or food that's going into trash cans and cafeterias, especially in elementary schools, is organic. 25% of it is liquids. Uh, we do a poor job of recycling. Um, in many schools right now, they're they are not recycling at all. So 100% of what's produced in the cafeteria during lunchtime is going into the trash. Uh, we currently have programs in six schools, four of them in, in Montgomery County, uh, two of them in Frederick County. There are eight more schools in Montgomery County that are going to be coming on board. Funding has up to now been uh, supplied by uh, students from BCC Elementary uh, High School, uh, received a $48,000 grant from the World Wildlife Fund to fund programs in eight Montgomery County schools for two years. Essentially what we do is we have four bins, liquids, organics, trash, and recycling, and we teach the kids, the students to put the appropriate items in the appropriate bin. And we're diverting waste by um, 80 to 87%. Um, at Greencastle, excuse me, Green Valley Elementary School, um, we've seen an enormous increase in organics going into the waste stream because now all students are eligible to get free lunches. And um, at the beginning of the year, they were averaging about 50 pounds organic weight uh, per day. They're now up to as much as 130. Kids don't have time to eat it. Um, food is not up to par for some of the students. Students are, are picky, but we're seeing a 200 to 250% increase in organics going into the waste stream. And we, we need to get that out of the waste stream to compost it. Frederick, um, Frederick County has a compost facility. The largest compost capability we have now is in Prince George's County, um, and we need to increase capacity. But once students start doing this, there's really no going back. Um, the bill will provide for $500,000 in funding that would launch programs in over 200 schools next year. Uh, that would 
have over 120,000 students participating in this program. And once you start a program like this, it's difficult to go back. Um, the students embrace it. It's easy. It's easy to apply. There's this natural tendency for school systems and administrators to say, no, we really can't do this. It's burdensome on our staff. If it's structured properly, if you have green teams, we're working closely with Mayo and Laura Collard. Um, the students embrace it. They become the champions. They actually monitor the, the waste. They, they weigh the waste and they mentor students in the school. So it, it really is something that can be self-monitored and, and executed within each individual, individual schools if you give them guidance. So this would really, we have the ability to, pre to prevent upwards of 87% of what's going into the landfill or going to an incinerator by diverting that. Um, we, can, we will be able to educate uh, administrators, building services in different municipalities. And we know that uh, there's a cost associated with composting and having compost collection and compost bags and materials, but it will be offset. We, we believe and, and, and expect to prove that this is close to cost neutral. When you divert 87% of waste from cafeteria trash, you're saving money. There are fewer dumpster pulls. This isn't just a, an out-of-pocket expense, but it's something that school systems will be able to uh, budget and put in as a, as a, um, a line item. Uh, the CERT team, it used to be called CERT in Montgomery County, it now has a new name, Glen Zerate. They are very much encouraging this program. Their hope is to have 30 to 40 schools operating this program next year with this funding. And then by uh, 2024, having this implemented system-wide. We're close. Um, it's important to teach students so that students can teach us. We, we fail at recycling as adults. Um, we're throwing organics in the landfill and creating methane gas. And we can teach students to teach their parents and teach our community to do this. It's, um, it's an awesome bill. It comes very much in conjunction with Lord Delegate Shakudian's compost bill uh, that was passed last year. And, and this will accelerate the process of teaching people how to, to source separate and be responsible for their waste. Thank you, Joe, I appreciate that. And we do have one final bill here for Delegate Sharkoudian, but I'm not sure if we had uh, an advocate signed up to speak to it. Did we, if you, if you are here to speak, please unmute now. Okay, great, then I'm gonna take a minute here to do a, a quick question. Uh, let me turn my video back on. Okay, so I have a question here for the school-based food waste diversion. Uh, Bill, they're asking if the diversion grant will go towards composting facility operators. It will help pay for compost collection. What we lack is right now is capacity. So as it stands right now, Montgomery County would take their organics to Prince George's County. We need municipalities to, to start commercial compost facilities in each municipality. It'll pay for the hauling. It'll pay for the materials um, up front and, and the of teacher, staff, and administration. Great, thank you, Joe. And I wanna thank the panelists too who are actively answering those questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, we do have the ability to see them. So if you see a question up there and you have the answer, please feel free to put that in there so that we can uh, move quickly and be efficient with our time here. So thank you again, advocates, uh, for speaking for Delegate Sharkudi. And we're gonna move on now. Someone I'm very excited to present, uh, Chairman Pinsky. Senator Pinsky has been a champion for the environment for over 25 years in Maryland Legislature. He serves as the chair of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. He has a 100% perfect score on Maryland League of Conservation Voters Environmental Scorecard, and he has introduced a number of environmental bills over the years, including the Landmark Healthy Air Act and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act. He is returning as the sponsor of the Climate Solutions Now Act, which has been noted as a priority by our Senate President, Fer uh, Senate President Ferguson. And he will also be speaking on his water pollution control permit enforcement bill, which as a river keeper is something that I personally am very much looking forward to supporting. So I uh, welcome Chairman Pinsky. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I want to talk about the climate. Um, and we're very familiar, all of us, that the environmental problems are increasing exponentially. Uh, severe storm, flooding, hurricanes, sea level rise. Uh, farmers are losing cropland to saltwater intrusion. 
and businesses aren't able to open their doors if their streets are flooded. Um, we can't wait. We have to be bold, and there's a degree of urgency we've never seen before. That's why we need to pass a strong statewide legislation. Uh, the legislation uh, does two things. It sets broad goals of reductions, but it also calls for specific material concrete actions. Um, I'd love to say I can give you the number of the bill or send it to you, but it's not complete. We're still working on it. It should be ready uh, any day now. So let me run through some of the uh, components of the bill. And if there's time, we can take some questions. Uh, we are going to call for a 60% reduction by 2030 and uh, carbon neutrality by 2045. Uh, so that's the overall uh, umbrella goals that we need to set to really force actions uh, across the state. Specifically, there are a number of actions we also call for. Uh, we want to electrify both the state's own fleet of cars uh, and all school buses across the state. Uh, the state needs to lead by example, and, and hopefully there'll be federal money from the infrastructure uh, uh, legislation uh, to help pay for uh, electrifying the school buses, which emit a, a, a lot of har harmful things and add to the asthma a lot of our uh, young people, particularly people of color, are experiencing, um, which is a lead in that we do need to create a special emphasis in those communities that are disproportionately uh, affected by climate. Uh, and the change in climate. Um, we've got to put a focus on remedies and investment to communities, whether it's um, Baltimore City, Prince George's, the Eastern Montgomery County or the Eastern Shore, um, where uh, people are, are harmed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we need also to create a, an urban conservation core. Uh, the state uh, created a conservation core a number of years ago and uh, we need to do it in our urban communities to work on environmental justice and sustainability. Um, the, uh, uh, let me, uh, we also need to shift away from uh, using polluting energy and move to clean energy. Basically, we move to, need to move to electrification. Uh, the bill will call for new construction to be electric, when it comes to uh, heating and uh, air and, and water. Um, and also we have to do the retrofit. You know, most of our building stock has been here. Uh, even with new um, construction, you know, even by 2030, 2040, 80 or 90% will be of existing uh, buildings. We have to move rapidly or as rapidly as possible to start the retrofit with the heat pumps and shifting to uh, uh, clean energy uh, and electrification. We also need to look towards uh, having a systematic plan for our displaced workers. You know, as we move to clean energy and away from polluting energies, it's going to leave, potentially leave many working people and our union brothers and sisters out of work. We have to have a plan. We can't just say it'll happen. We've got to make sure that they have jobs and income so they can pay their rent or their mortgage or pay for college for their young children. Um, so we, we call for what's called a just transition work group. So we can have as a state, a plan and it could cost money, but we've got to have that idea in mind and not just do this randomly. We have to have a, a clear idea of how we're going to deal with those working families so they're not displaced. Uh, a couple of other areas on this bill, um, we need to address school construction. Uh, again, the state needs to lead by example, and we have to make uh, new schools so that come online, more reliant on clean energy and less on old technologies. Uh, finally, um, we have to create green banks or, or a state green bank to help fund these efforts. So, you know, we have an, a number of things in this bill. It's, it's an honor this bill. It covers a lot of things. But as we know, the, the effect of climate is affecting us in all aspects of our life. So we need to put Maryland in, in the upper ranks uh, across the nation uh, when it comes to, to fighting uh, climate change and come up with the solutions that are needed. Uh, we used to be a leader. Uh, the recent study by the Able Foundation said we've fallen behind. Uh, we have to put us back in the, the, the top state, the top two or three states when it comes to, to fighting this battle and to show other states around the country that there are solutions and with the will 
and, and the belief and the grassroots effort and movement that you're a part of that we can make this work. So that's uh, that bill. Let me just very quickly jump to the second bill. Uh, and that's, uh, as Ellie mentioned, about permits and, and inspections. The Department of the Environment has fallen down on its job. It's not protecting the public. They don't care about enforcing, enforcement. They're not doing inspections. They're not fining those people who are out of compliance. So we need to protect our waterways. We have to uh, protect public health. We have a number of uh, institutions, facilities that are significantly out of compliance with the laws. What happens then? Nothing. They aren't fined, they aren't inspected. And then when their permit runs out, or uh, even if they're not in, in, uh, out of compliance, if their permit runs out, they just get an extension. Some of these buildings and facilities have been running for 15, 18 years on a permit that, that went out of date uh, in 1902, uh, 2002, 2004, and nothing's being done. But again, it's endangering our lives. So we're uh, going to be introducing a bill um, that deals with non-compliance and zombie permits. And a zombie permit is you know, like the walking dead. It's a permit that doesn't exist anymore. But we allow these facilities that are using water, uh, emitting things into our streams and rivers to continue acting like they have. Uh, the bill will call for more regular inspections, fines for those people who don't come around, and getting rid of this old idea that you can just continue a, a permit and let a, a company function and not having to update their, their practices or comply with new standards and laws. That's got to end. We've got to have a department of the environment that works for the people, uh, not work for the corporations. Uh, and unfortunately, over the last seven and a half years, they've fallen down on the job. That's got to come to an end. Uh, now, um, is Robin with us? Uh, I wanted to give her a few minutes if she is. Yes, I am, Senator. And we also have take Matt, over, Robin. Matt Pluta from Shore River. Sure. I'll just um, dovetailing off of the, the chairman's remarks, uh, you know, we saw this year, just this year, major sewer overflows in Baltimore City in the Baltimore Harbor. This is, this is matter that is dangerous to, to human health, dangerous to exposure. We saw down in St. Mary's County, um, sewage overflows that um, caused dozens of people to become sick off of consum consuming oysters following the sewage overflow. So it's uh, a reality that we're seeing now on a regular basis in the news that there is non-compliance with permits, um, both at from wastewater treatment plants, they might be municipal wastewater treatment plants, they might be private wastewater treatment plants serving mobile home units, or it could be one of our industrial sites. These industrial sites are clustered in high population areas, 102 sites that need stormwater permits in the Baltimore city area. There's also clustering um, relevant for this group around Salisbury. So um, we're really trying to lock in not, not increasing the requirements, but just trying to hold those businesses operating in our state and wastewater treatment plants to the requirements to which they've committed through their permits and their licenses. Um, with regard to wastewater treatment, why is the Chesapeake Bay so out on this? One of the reasons is because we've, as taxpayers at the state level and at the local level, have put up to a billion dollars, probably more, in upgrading our wastewater treatment plants with the expectation that we are going to clean up the Chesapeake Bay through that effort. And we need to hold fast to those commitments or else we might be even further from the goals that we're trying to reach by 2025. I'll turn it over to Matt to say a few words too. Hey, thanks, Robin, and, and thanks, Senator Pinsky, for, for sponsoring this important bill. As Ellie said, as a river keeper, it doesn't get more um, pointed and specific than, you know, how we can protect our rivers from permitted polluters is, is what we're talking about here. And so just to, to sort of frame this or what it looks like on the eastern shore, you know, these are facilities who have permits to discharge waste into the rivers, whether it be municipal sewage or industrial wastewater from processing facilities or, or anything that's generating waste. The, per, the, the state permits them to discharge certain levels of that waste into the, into, the, into the rivers. And the way it functions is these permits are supposed to be renewed every five years. And after five years, the technology and the regulatory 
um, systems are supposed to be looked at and incorporated into new permits. And when the state decides to administratively extend them, essentially what they're doing is ignoring that expiration date and allowing these permits to live on with really no deadline and really no update in technology uh, and no update in, in the regulatory um, conditions of those permits. And so, as the Senator said, these are, these are the walking dead. These are permits that don't die. These conditions will live on as long as they're administratively continued under the, under the state's laws and, and the state seems fine with that. Now on the Eastern shore and, and especially in Dorchester County, this hits home for me um, when we're, we're dealing with one of the oldest zombie permits in the state of Maryland. Now I'll back up and say there is over 150 zombie permits throughout the entire state. Um, but one of the oldest ones is, is in Dorchester County. It's a rendering facility and the permit expired in 2006. Now think of all the advancements that have happened in the regulatory um, world. We've had the Bay TMDL enlisted. We've had ENR plants come online for enhanced nutrient removal of, of wastewater. And none of that is incorporated in this permit because it expired so long ago, but has not been addressed. And so when we have situations like this, we see the, the sort of the oversight fall off on these permits. And this is exactly what this bill is, in, is intending to do is provide more oversight so that when we have a permit that's extended, we don't catch it in violation as well because a, a permit that's in violation that's already extended makes a bad situation even worse. And so we're hopeful that with monthly inspections, um, MDE will, will be able to catch any violations before they become bad or, or prevent them from happening to begin with. And that we're also hopeful that MDE will realize what it takes as an agency to, to staff up and to have the adequate resources to oversee these permitted facilities, which are, are very thank crucial to, to the water quality of our Eastern shore. Thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, so I just wanna say in closing, we need your help. Uh, we need you to be active and engaged and involved and, and talk to your um, legislators to help us get this bill across the finish line. Um, last year, we had some bumps uh, bringing it across the finish line in the House. This year, uh, we're united with the House and Senate to get this done. So please get engaged, get involved, and write or um, organize in your communities to uh, help the passage. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pinsky. Thank you to the advocates. We actually are ahead of schedule, if you can believe it. That doesn't happen often on these things. So I'm going to take the time here to answer or ask a quick question. Uh, and I really appreciate everyone who's using this Q&A feature and to our advocates who are actively typing in answers. I encourage you, again, if you're a panelist, check out the Q&A if there's some really great questions in here. Um, so this looks like a good question for the enforcement bill. Will this bill help close the loophole between MDE's inspection and permit issuance divisions? It seems like they aren't coordinating or communicating well, and that is an issue. Uh, maybe Robin or Matt, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, uh, yeah, Ellie, yeah, look, I don't think it's a, a, a matter of miscommunication. I believe the Hogan administration hasn't cared about enforcement or inspections. And they've cut back in those in, in every agency across the administration of enforcement and inspections. You know, it's, it's not like one department doesn't know what the other is doing. They just haven't cared. You know, they, they put their time and energy elsewhere. They don't want to tell uh, uh, a company, uh, 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 somebody who's emitting bad things that you're wrong and you got to correct it or we're going to fine you. They just don't want to do that. It's not a matter of communications. It's a matter of will. And unfortunately, this administration has not had the will to protect the public. Thank you, Senator. And I, one more here on your Climate Solutions Now Act. Does the act support banning coal exports from Maryland? exports from Maryland? Uh, it, it doesn't address that. There's very little coal being exported. You know, uh, the, the, the remaining three or four coal-fired power plants are now scheduled to close in the next two or three years. Uh, the, you know, coal is going to be a thing of the past very, very quickly. But we have to gear up on clean energy, on, on solar, on wind, on um, uh, uh, all, all the other clean energies, and we have to ramp that up as quickly as we can. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your time, and thank you for sponsoring these important bills. Thank you. Okay, moving on, I'd like to welcome Delegate Sample Hughes, who was first elected in 2014. Uh, Sample Hughes, Delegate Sample Hughes is the current Speaker Pro Tem and was awarded as one of Maryland's top 100 women in 2020. She represents Dorchester and Wacomico counties right here on the Eastern Shore, and she serves on the Health and Government Operation Committee. 
Delegate Sample Hughes has served in numerous leadership roles in the legislature, and she is now taking the lead on an environmental bill that will address the greenhouse gas emissions from construction materials. Everyone, please welcome Delegate Sample Hughes. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you so much for the introduction. And again, good afternoon to all. Um, it certainly is a pleasure to be with you on this afternoon. Um, I know the past, what, three to four years, I believe, I've been able to participate in this um, very educational opportunity, I believe, um, on this subject. And, and we also, a, a couple of years ago, when we were over at uh, Washington College, had the opportunity to delve in a little bit more as it relates to climate change and agricultural and things of that nature. Um, so I counted the opportunity to get the information out to the community and keep everybody engaged and finding out what's coming um, down the pike, or if you will, or in the forefront as we tackle our next legislative session. Um, so this year in particular, um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, I'll be putting forth a piece of legislation that really goes into the depths of the state being able to purchase um, or make better purchasing decisions as it relates to materials that are used in buildings. I did uh, offer and put in legislation on last year uh, around the same subject, dealing with concrete and wanting our specifically Department of Transportation to look at their buying decisions um, and making sure that we're looking to reduce our carbon footprint and ensuring that um, the state, as Senator Pinsky said, uh, is a leader in making sure that we are putting our best foot forward to uh, be a part of and to help change um, the trajectory of affecting uh, greenhouse emissions and the carbon footprint. So um, to that end, this year, um, the Buy Clean effort is really tab tackling um, our procurement policy making sure that any decisions that are being made as a result as results, results to um, construction, whether it's our schools, whether it's our roads and all of those things in particular, that we're incorporating low carbon uh, construction products. And this in and of itself is important because as we make our uh, decisions on capital projects, and we are um, fighting in our communities for major projects to occur, we at least could have um, and really appreciate that we're doing our due diligence to ensure that we're part of the positive solution to reduce that low carbon um, in our community and the greenhouse gas emissions, specifically in construction materials. So this um, in particular would require that we provide or, or create a procurement preference. Um, as you probably are many are aware of that um, our building sector emissions are responsible for at least 40% of our energy related global greenhouse gas emissions. And with that in particular, 11% of that deals with the production of the building materials. And so um, we can make a difference towards that end. We can make that particular change by changing some of our policies. Um, some of the tools that this legislation would help um, make or, or make bring change about would provide some incentives. Um, it would also provide standards so we can across the board work with our Department of General Services um, to provide those standards, making sure that when we are at a specific number or a maximum, um, so we, we can not go beyond a particular uh, percentage of the, the carbon, um, that we, we have that as a standard and not as just a suggestion or not as something that we're desiring to do. So by putting forth a piece of legislation to really address that and to make that as a part of our standard practice in the state of Maryland is really where I'm wanting to go with, with this piece of legislation. Um, not only will it certainly shift our thinking um, and our state government practices, but we want to shift the thinking um, in our private sector community as well uh, by knowing that these are tools that we can put in place um, to ensure that our community is healthier, um, ensure that the buildings we put up are going to, you know, certainly last the test of time, but uh, will affect generations of many 
to come that they're working in buildings that are healthier and that we are um, making that difference right here in the state of Maryland. So um, last year when I had this bill in, it's tweaked a little bit for this year, but last year was of the same intent. It was the intent of making sure that um, our carbon footprint would be reduced, that we're trying to do our due diligence at the state level um, and making sure that the construction materials are, um, are, are not going to be causing additional harm. And this is just one tool, one action that we could do uh, as a state and certainly, as I said, shift the thinking for all um, in this area. Lastly, I'll say is that um, the state of Colorado has been and is a leader in this space um, and moving the policies forward. And I think that again, in Maryland, we can certainly do the same. Um, so to that end, when the legislation um, is heard and I just want to reiterate that we certainly need the support and the champions of those who believe that this is a good measure, um, that we can move the needle on this, then I certainly welcome the support um, because as it stands today, all of us here, legislators that are um, trying to move the needle on pieces of legislation, welcome the support of our community, of our advocates. And so um, to that end, looking for your support on Buy Clean uh, Maryland 20, 2022 um, in the construction arena, if you will, to make sure that we're moving the needle in a positive direction. So thank you for your time today and uh, certainly look forward to your support while we um, reconvene um, on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. It's hard to believe that you reconvene already on Wednesday. Uh, we did have a question. I'm wondering if you could give us an example of some of these problem construction materials that this bill would address. Well, in particular, um, we were focused again last year specifically on the concrete because we know that concrete is widely used in everything. And matter of fact, it was uh, noted that it's widely used more so than water. Um, and every time you turn around, some of us are on highways and, and knowing that these construction projects are happening day in and day out. But we found that if there is a specific type of concrete that can be used, um, that can reduce that carbon footprint and really make um, our usage of that material better, then it makes it all the better for us to have a cleaner environment. And so my focus, again, as I said last year, was specifically um, on the concrete piece, but we're also looking you know, at other areas um, of, of wood that has been something that has been brought up. And um, so those are some type of examples, but um, the goal at the end of the day is to ensure that any type of materials that we can look at as a state and work with our procurement um, officer through the Department of General Services that we know that can affect this, then that's the goal. That's the goal to move that needle in that direction. But mainly, again, was our construction, our highways projects was originally um, the intent. Yes, thank you. And as the Eastern Shore continues to grow in population, certain, certainly something that affects us here uh, as well as throughout the state. Thank you for your time. Sure, thank you. Next up, I welcome uh, Delegate Ludke. Delegate Ludke serves as the House Majority Leader and is a strong advocate for families, small businesses, and students. Personally, as someone who was introduced to the world and career of conservation through environmental education, I especially applaud Delegate Ludke for his stance that every kid, regardless of zip code, deserves access to nature and environmental education. He himself is an avid outdoorsman, and he is a prominent advocate for preserving our environment and open spaces. He's joining us today to speak on a bill that will do just that, the Conservation Parity Act. So everyone, please welcome Delegate Ludke. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone uh, who's participating in this for, for your incredible advocacy for uh, our environment uh, and our bay. Um, we're actually, the Conservation Parity Act is like a, a, you know, a temporary name. We, we probably won't be called that at the end of the day. It's in drafting right now, but um, I'm really excited this year to be working with uh, Senator Sarah Alfreth um, and with a number of interest groups, including um, the uh, Chesapeake Conservancy, uh, on this legislation. And, and I know many of you are aware that at the federal level, um, President Biden has been pushing this idea called 30 by 30. Um, so what this bill is, is essentially a, a commitment by the state of Maryland to meet that goal. And not only to meet that goal, but to exceed it. Um, because Maryland is already ahead of the curve, uh, in particular on land conservation. 
Um, if we continue our commitment to our existing land conservation programs, uh, we will almost certainly hit 30 by 30, 30% 30 of our lands being preserved in some form by the year 2030. Um, so what the bill is proposing is that we set that as a goal, but then we extend it. Um, that we, we set a goal for 10 years further out and try to, try to aim for 40% by 2040. Uh, in order to achieve that goal, um, the bill also affects three different programs, two of which are going to be new, um, that, that sort of fill holes in our current land conservation programming. Um, the first is the creation of something we're calling the Green Space Equity Program. Um, many of you may be familiar with uh, the Rural Legacy Program and other programs like it that help to preserve land in rural areas. Well, we don't really have a program that's really focused on the same goal in more urban parts of the state and underserved parts of the state. And by urban, I'm not just talking about places like the city of Baltimore. I'm talking about Salisbury. I'm talking about Cambridge. I'm talking about towns all over the state of Maryland. Um, so the Green Space Equity Program is going to provide funding specifically for smaller projects in uh, more, more concentrated, more urban communities, pocket parks, urban green space, urban wetlands, community gardens, those kinds of things. The second uh, program is, is a, a new revolving loan fund uh, that will help land trusts who uh, have an opportunity to purchase land on relatively short notice but don't necessarily have the immediate capital available to make that purchase so we're going to create this revolving loan fund which will essentially lend money to the loan trust so they can make a quick purchase of land when it comes on the market for conservation purposes and then they'll pay back um, the the state the revolving loan fund uh, for the, the the cost of that project and then finally um, there's a program we have called the mel noland woodland incentives fund one of the uh, conversations that, that we've been having a lot, Senator Alfreth and I and other folks involved in this, um, is uh, about the, the fact that preserving land is important, but once you protect it, you also have to steward it. Um, and that relates to something I'll mention in a second too. But the Mel Nolan Woodland Incentives Fund is aimed at stewardship of forest lands. Um, and it's been underfunded uh, basically since its creation. So the bill will create a mandated appropriation um, for uh, the Woodland Incentives Fund. I, I'll also mention it's 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 uh, related a little bit to this, but I, I know many of you are aware that Senator Alfreth and I and, and former Governor Glenn Denning and some of our colleagues worked on a, um, a commission over the summer and fall on the state park system. Um, and, you know, the bottom line of what we learned in that commission is that we have been essentially negligent in protecting and preserving state park land uh, in Maryland. And um, we, we see that in plenty of ways, including on the Eastern Shore just in the last couple of weeks when the fishing piers at uh, the, uh, uh, the state park in Cambridge um, were shut down due to structural integrity issues on the piers. Um, that's a direct result of decades of underinvestment in maintenance in our state parks, uh, underinvestment in our state park rangers, underinvestment in the creation of new state parks. Um, and so we're also, Senator Alfeth and I, going to be proposing legislation to enact the recommendations of the State Parks Commission, which will include, um, we, we think, likely the largest single investment in Maryland's history in our state park system over the next few years, which is long overdue. Um, so I will stop talking. I will turn it over to my friend Reed Perry from uh, the Chesapeake Conservancy, who may have some uh, words to add about 30 by 30. Thank you so much, Delia Lutke, and, and thank you uh, to you and to Senator Alfreth for your leadership on this, this uh, great and exciting proposal for Maryland. Um, Maryland is uh, a leader in conservation uh, across its peer states in our country, and that's largely thanks to our dedicated funding with program open space. Uh, so as Delia Lutke said, we're well on our way to achieving 30%, but we're so excited that this bill uh, puts Maryland ahead of the pack in the 30 by 30 movement by setting a 40 by 40 goal as well and uh, setting up the structure to track and implement our conservation progress going forward. And uh, despite, you know, program open space and our successful conservation efforts thus far, we know that uh, development continues to pressure uh, our existing natural lands, forest lands, agricultural lands, etc. cetera. Uh, population continues to grow. And, uh, and so it's important that we, we set this goal uh, for our state. Um, and uh, we'd also like to 
uh, applaud their efforts to make sure that the bill doesn't just set a goal, but it actually uh, seeks to improve and enhance and accelerate conservation from a number of different aspects. Um, so I think uh, Delegate Lukey did a great job of outlining what you know, we think uh, is gonna be in the bill. I just wanna say that we are pulling together advocates uh, soon uh, for, for a kickoff meeting to talk about our advocacy efforts for this legislative session. And I will, uh, I guess, put my email in the chat and you can feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll make sure you're in that, that group. Thank you both. As somebody who takes students on field trips to the Bill Burton Fishing Pier in Cambridge, I very much appreciate you, um, you know, noticing that that is an issue, not just on the Eastern Shore, but in the state and, and bringing something, an another solution, you know, to a real problem that we have here. So thank you. I'm going to move on, keep us on time here to Delegate Bond Stewart, who was elected in 2018. Delegate Stewart brings an incredible amount of energy and passion to his elected duties of serving the people of Maryland. He has sponsored many environmental bills on legislation that holds polluters accountable, bans to toxic substances, and combats the challenge of climate change. I always look forward to the passion Delegate Stewart brings when testifying on one of his bills. And this year, Delegate Stewart, who is a member of the Environment and Transportation Committee, is working on safe drinking water for Marylanders and on the RPS cleanup. Please welcome Delegate Bond Stewart. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, uh, the kind words and the warm welcome. It's awesome to join everyone this, this um, Saturday and kudos to everyone who is uh, giving up at least a decent chunk of their Saturday to talk about so many important issues, talk about environmental justice, climate justice, and the health of our, um, our waterways. Um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, my colleague Caitlin in a minute, but, but first, um, the first bill that I'm going to discuss of, of two bills is a bill on well water safety. Um, and so there are about 2 million Marylanders whose drinking water comes from a private well, but Maryland ranks in the bottom five um, nationwide of the amount of regulations um, that, are, that are basically put on these wells. And uh, a report from the Center for Progressive Reform um, about a year ago um, found that uh, the, the basically a number of our wells, especially those on the shore, could have toxic levels of some substances. And one particular contaminant that's worrying um, is nitrates. Um, nitrates form when nitrogen breaks down and they can pollute groundwater when fertilizer or manure, like from chicken uh, facilities, are mismanaged or overapplied to fields. And um, nitrates are really scary because they're odorless and colorless and tasteless. Um, but that high nitrate levels in drinking water are linked to a condition um, that, that's pretty terrifying, especially if someone with a three-year-old called blue baby syndrome that is uh, this fatal to, to, to infants. Um, and nitrates are, are a particular concern on the lower eastern shore uh, just because of the density of the um, basically the factory farm industry on the lower shore. And, and I think that the well, wells in uh, Wicomico and Worcester County are especially likely to have um, high levels of nitrate. So this is the sort of our second um, go round with, with, with this bill, with the idea that we're gonna put some more regulations in place to ensure that every Marylander can have safe drinking water. Last year, we put in a version of the bill that was very, very bold and ended up being paired back into a bill essentially to require landlords to test uh, the well water um, if they have tenants. And, this to me sounds like an extremely no-brainer approach to make sure that you know landlords aren't poisoning their tenants. But oddly enough, this ended up be proving to be one of the most controversial bills of the session, with Republicans lambasting it at every opportunity um, on the floor as some sort of like crazy government overreach. But fortunately, um, the bill ended up being the final bill that the House of Delegates passed on signing die right at eleven. 59. And so uh, Maryland will become one of the states that actually at the very mi bare minimum requires landlords to test well water um, to make sure that they're not uh, inadvertently poisoning their tenants. But we're back this session with a, an, another bigger and bolder proposal that touches a number of different aspects of this problem. Um, it touches the idea that we want to make sure that low income Marylanders have access to funds to remediate a poison well. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a statewide database so that we can track which wells are poison and where they are and, and where they're concentrated. And we wanna make sure that more wells are tested so that 
uh, folks essentially aren't drinking poison well water. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create a state, and especially here in Maryland, where you know we're the wealthiest state in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we want to make sure that every single person um, can be guaranteed safe drinking water. So with that, Caitlin, I'm going to kick it over to you, if that's okay, to talk about a little bit more in detail what we're talking about here. Thank you, Delica Stewart, and thank you for your leadership on safe drinking water in Maryland. Um, so I am Caitlin Schmidt. I'm a policy analyst at the Center for Progressive Reform. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, so roughly 350,000 Maryland households rely on well water as their primary drinking source, but Maryland well owners are expected to take the safety of their drinking water into their own hands, but many believe that their well water is either safe to drink, do not know whether they should test it annually, um, or just don't even really have the funds to be able to prioritize the cost of testing. So as Delegate Stewart mentioned, Maryland ranked among the five states with the fewest well water protections. The Private Well Safety Act would bring Maryland in line with the protections that and resources that other states provide to well owners. So an earlier version of this legislation was introduced um, during the 2021 legislative session in response to the report that Delegate Stewart mentioned that had found potentially harmful levels of nitrates in, in drinking water on Maryland's Eastern shore. Um, so last year, another study actually was also published um, in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health that cancer patients on the lower shore and particularly those with colon cancer which has been linked to nitrates, um, were more likely to rely on private wells. Um, nitrate pollution also may disproportionately harm lower income residents who may not be able to afford the cost of a treatment system um, or the necessary remediation if testing finds that contamination is there. Um, so the Private Well Safety Act of 2022 would ensure that low-income residents have the financial resources to test their well water and remediate if any contamination is found due to harmful levels of nitrates or other harmful contaminants that are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, so lastly, the act encourages transparency um, by creating an accessible online database of well water quality test results and requires the state to engage in basic data and information gathering to ensure that the state has all of the data it needs to respond to and adequately protect Maryland's groundwater drinking water sources from further pollution. So if you'd like to get involved or learn more about the Private Well Safety Act, please email me. I'm going to uh, copy my email in the chat because there's just a, a typo there. Um, but thank you so much for this opportunity to, to present today um, and happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Caitlin, um, for those words and for working with me on that bill. I think it's really important and optimistic that we're finally going to get it over the hump this session after putting in a lot of work and you in particular putting in a lot of work um, over the interim. So moving on to bill number two of two, um, uh, I'm now gonna be chat, uh, chat, chatting a little bit about a bill called the Reclaim Renewable Energy Act. This is a bill that many of you probably have heard of because I think it, it is hopefully gonna be at least um, a bill that is a bit of a headliner um, in this sort of climate and environmental space in the upcoming session. It's a bill uh, idea that has been kicked around for a number of years and has been introduced in a number of forms. Um, so as um, as y'all probably know, uh, in Maryland, you know, our, our basically our big renewable energy program is called the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And it sets goals for how much energy, we, renewable energy we use. And it basically defines what we count as renewable energy. And our current goal is for uh, energy suppliers to sell a minimum of 50% renewable energy by 2030. Um, and as you would expect, um, the RPS includes under the definition of, you know, essentially renewable energy, all the good stuff like wind and solar and geo geothermal. But unfortunately, it also includes lots of polluting energy sources that don't help us uh, move the ball on climate change. And so it includes things like uh, waste incineration, uh, burning wood, landfill gas, burning chicken poop. Uh, and also, as we're going to hear about later, uh, you biogas produced from anaerobic digestion of organic waste, which also includes waste from factory farms and from slaughterhouses. And all these dirty, dirty injury sources emit carbon into the atmosphere, some at higher rates than others. And a lot of them also can uh, contribute to air pollution in and around uh, the communities that they're placed in. Um, Maryland ratepayers have contributed um, over $30 million to buy what are called RECs from dirty energy sources 
just annually. Um, just in 2019 alone, that's 30 million. And so every time essentially you pay your utility bill to Pepco or whoever every month, um, a small portion of that is going to subsidize dirty energy uh, that is harming uh, not only human health, but harming uh, the environment. Um, we are, the other big aspect of this is that um, by subsidizing so many dirty energy sources, we're not allocating our resources towards true clean energy and therefore supporting the 21st job, 21st century jobs of the future um, that we want. We know that um, jobs in the wind sector and the solar sector are exploding right now, and a number of our neighboring states are taking advantage of that and really becoming hotbeds for the jobs of the 21st century. Many of them uh, are great jobs that pay living wages and are, are um, unionized. Um, but by diverting so many of our resources, I think we're the only state in the country, for example, that subsidizes the burning of trash and calling that clean energy. It just does a disservice to, to the economy, to human health, uh, and to the planet. And so while these giveaways are great for corporate polluters, they're terrible for working families. And these handouts mean not only fewer jobs, they mean higher utility bills, and they mean a dirtier Maryland. And so it's way past time. We've been debating this for years and years. It's way past time to turn off this pollution spigot. Um, and so with that, I will kick it over to Monica Brooks, who is uh, one of the leading members of the coalition that has formed around this bill and this proposal. And uh, one of the many people, along with hopefully a lot of y'all, that are going to help us get, uh, get this bill over the finish line. Thank you so much, Delegate Stewart. I'm so um, happy to be here. My name is Monica Brooks, and I'm speaking as a member of the Reclaim Renewable Energy Coalition. And we came together in order to shore up the existing um, renewable, um, I mean, this existing um, already on the books bill. And our goal is to ramp up the supply of emission free electricity on our grid and reduce the system of polluting fossil fuels, including trash incineration and factory farm biogas which emit dangerous levels of um, asthma and cancer causing pollutants into our environment. Currently on the Eastern Shore, we have high rates of um, respiratory diseases, cancer. Um, our communities are constantly being um, plagued with concentrated animal feeding operations, factory farms being placed in their backyards, um, DAF tanks. We have a 3 million gallon DAF tank um, in a community here on in Wicomico County. Um, an open area full of sludge and, and poultry waste and trash incinerators. Now, um, this month, um, we have another um, gasification plant that wants to come into one of our communities. Our communities of color continue to be the ones that are mostly threatened with these types of industries. And um, if we can just shore up this bill, then we can be in a better position to allow communities to be safer and protected. Um, the Eastern Shore um, has a, it's a beautiful place, but we want to keep it beautiful and protected and protect our citizens in a way that um, they can feel safe. This idea of putting that these particular industries under um, the guise of green energy, when they produce more greenhouse emissions and gases than say, um, gas, fossil fuels, it's on the same level, but to be subsidized by something, to have to put your money into being subsidized um, into an, uh, an arena that brings harm to your community is not right. So our coalition is um, just happy to support this bill with Delegate Stewart. Um, it is an amazing bill. Um, and we want everyone to contact their local legislators, contact anyone you know, and ask that um, this RPS bill be shored up the way that it needs to be. And um, thank you, Delegate Stewart. Yeah, thank, thank you. you both. And, and do you want me to handle this question in the chat? I was gonna say, yeah, we do have a good question here on the RPS cleanup ledger. So the, the question here, is why has the RPS cleanup legislation been so hard to pass? And why is there so much opposition to removing trash and incineration specifically from the RPS standard? Sure, yeah, I mean, I'll take a crack at this and Monica, I'll pass it off to you too. I mean, you know, essentially the answer is that some really powerful and wealthy corporate interests make money off of these subsidies. That's the short answer. There are some companies out there that um, find it extremely profitable 
to take some off the top of our payments on utility bills. It's They make millions off of it. And then they divert some of those millions into lobbyists and campaign contributions to sway my colleagues into voting against legislation that would improve the health of their constituents and improve the, the quality of the environment in the state that they live in. That's essentially the short answer. And the only way we're going to beat organized money is with organized people, because that's the only way we've ever been able to topple organized money in this space. I mean, these issues are going to keep coming up, whether it's this bill, other bills you hear about today or tomorrow, where you have human health and the quality in the environment on the other hand, and you have corporate profits and corporate greed on the other hand. And the only way we'll ever win is if enough of us regular folks stand together and fight back. Um, Monica, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, we're, I mean, the very first time that I brought up this issue specifically to our governor many years ago um, and saying that we need to do something about factory farm emissions and all of this, I was specifically told we don't want to bother with the poultry industry because it brings so much money into our state. Delegate Stewart said it, um, it's about money. It's about money and power and no one should be excluded no matter what industry, no matter how much money you bring in, should not be excluded from doing the right thing to being um, to not being a bad actor. It does not make you against an industry. It makes you for people, for health, for community, and for um, a positive um, effect on climate change, which is real. Thank you both. I, again, I think everyone can tell the passion that Delegate Bond Stewart and these advocates bringing to this issue. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing. Moving on now to Delegate Ruth. Delegate Ruth also serves on the Environment and Transportation Committee, same as uh, Delegate Bond Stewart. Her priorities often focus on transit, equity, racial justice, and climate. Not only is she an ally in the fight against climate change by supporting legislation that addresses sea level rise and clean energy, but she is also a major advocate for smart growth development that benefits the community without causing environmental harm. She's sponsoring a number of bills this session that will address some of these topics and more. Please welcome, oh my gosh, with a cat, I love it, Delegate Ruth. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I guess you can see my, my assistant here is Pride and he likes to sit with me when I'm on Zoom. Um, and, and so actually I would like um, if, if you could, uh, uh, enable her, I would like Isla Shorenstein to speak first. Sure. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on, on this bill and then hand it back over kindly to Delegate Ruth to explain what the bill does. Um, but some background here. So, you know, the Attorney General's office has a pretty long history of holding bad actors accountable for the damage that they caused to the people of Maryland. And so, when the tobacco and the opioid industries engaged in fraudulent and even deceptive practices that resulted in public health crises, the attorney general took action to hold them accountable for these resulting harms um, these, that these actions caused to Maryland communities. And so our communities are now, of course, facing this really, this existential threat from climate change with sea level rise, increasingly severe storms, flooding, and more frequent and even intense heat waves that threaten, again, public health and the safety of Maryland's citizens and environment. And just a you know, a little bit more context in 2018, as many of you well know, residents and business owners of Ellicott City found themselves rebuilding for a second time in as many years due to flash floods. The city of Annapolis has experienced the greatest recorded increase in average annual nuisance flooding events of any city in the nation. Um, the Eastern Shore is experiencing increasingly severe damage and power outages from tornadoes made worse by both tropical storms and hurricanes. And the list obviously goes on and on. And so the impacts and the costs associated with climate change are threatening the homes, uh, the livelihoods, and the safety of local Maryland communities. And adaptation and resiliency infrastructure is, of course, extremely expensive. Um, there is a 2019 study by the Center for Climate Integrity, the organization that I'm employed by, um, that shows that Maryland taxpayers can expect to spend up to $27.5 billion by 2040 on coastal defenses just alone to guard uh, frontline communities against rising seas. And it's important to note too that four out of the five most costly counties that were analyzed in the study are located in, on the Eastern shore. 
And so this is just one of many costly but needed expenditures that the state faces as it defends against a obviously very wide range of climate driven impacts. And so without the ability to recover the costs of climate adaptation, resilience and recovery, state and local governments are really forced to cut existing public services, raise taxes, and even potentially relocate entire neighborhoods as these climate related threats and expenditures continue to rise. But it's incredibly important to note for this work that this crisis was not a foregone conclusion. The climate emergency that we find ourselves in was created by decades of denial and deception and disinformation by the fossil fuel industry. And there are hundreds of internal industry documents that show that these fossil fuel companies predicted as far back as the 1960s that their products would cause, quote, catastrophic climate impacts. And so instead of disclosing what they knew, the industry deliberately misled the public and policymakers and the media about the dangers of climate change in order to protect their profits. These companies did not play fair. They violated state law. And now communities are the ones paying the price um, for their actions and inactions. And so this bill comes as 27 communities from across the nation, including the cities of Annapolis and Baltimore, as well as Anne Arundel County, have actually filed lawsuits to hold these oil and gas companies accountable for this decades long campaign of fraud and deception and make sure that the costs of climate related adaptation, resilience and recovery are not borne solely by taxpayers. And since 2018, there have been seven attorneys general, including Carl Racine of Washington, D.C. and Kathy Jennings in Delaware, that have taken statewide action in order to hold these companies accountable and seek justice for all of their state's residents. Um, but these cases are incredibly complex, similar to the opioid and the tobacco cases. Um, holding bad actors to account is time and resource intensive, and unfortunately, not all communities have the resources to pursue litigation on their own. Many need the help from private counsel um, or other experts in this type of litigation. And it's important to note again, too, that low income communities and communities of color are not only more vulnerable to climate related disasters and impacts as a result of ongoing legacies of systemic inequality, and environmental racism, but they're also put at a disadvantage when it comes to the distribution of funds and access to the resources necessary to recover from disasters, adapt to future impacts, or even pursue litigation. Furthermore, unincorporated communities such as Ellicott City, which are unable to file their own lawsuit to recover damages from flooding and other disasters, find themselves particularly reliant on the Attorney General's office to act on their behalf. So just as the tobacco and the opioid and the lead manufacturers and other industries were held to account for their fraud and for their deception and the resulting harms that they caused to communities, the fossil fuel industry in turn must not be allowed to escape legal accountability um, and pass off these extraordinary costs of its business with impunity. Um, so that is the context and background, but I will, we are excited to work with the de delegate Ruth on this and I'll hand it over to her to discuss some of the more mechanics of this bill. That, thank you so much. And, um, you know, as, uh, as Isla said, um, you know, this, this is a huge cost. And the, the IPCC has said the climate crisis is inevitable and irreversible at this point. Um, and, and there are going to be huge costs. And state should, the state should not be left holding the bag for the fraudulent actions of, you know, some bad actors. So this bill is actually pretty simple. And, and this was 2021, HB 1078, was sponsored by Delegate Jen Terrassa. Um, Delegate Terrassa and I are working together on this. I will be the lead sponsor, but she will also be jointly sponsoring it. Um, and so we're, we're working closely together on this bill. The bill itself is pretty simple. It, it authorizes the Attorney General to investigate, commence, prosecute, or defend any civil or criminal suit or action. Um, one change that we're making this session um, is that it limits to publicly traded entities with a market capitalization greater than one billion and subsidiaries. And you know we're we're doing that because we got feedback last session um, that you know there are a lot of small independent uh, fuel distributors and and they're not really the ones who cause this problem. They're not the ones who deceived the public and fraudulently um, stopped any kind of action that would have you know, that would have uh, solved the crisis. And so we, we don't want them to be caught up in this. 
we want these suits to be against ExxonMobil and the other, you know, large corporations who are the ones who caused this crisis um, and, you know, deceived the public. So, um, so that's one change. Um, in addition to authorizing the attorney general to, um, to, to file any kind of suit, it also authorizes the attorney general, he or she, to um, uh, hire outside counsel on a contingency basis. So there would be no upfront cost to the state. Um, the, the outside counsel would, um, you know, get a, as on a contingency basis, get a, a portion of, you know, whatever is recovered. Um, so this is a really important bill. The attorney general supports it. Um, we're hoping that any future attorney general will support it also. Um, and uh, if you are interested in supporting it, I'm going to put a link in the chat um, to uh, how you can sign up to support any of the four bills that I'm presenting today. So, so thank you so much. Okay, and so um, at this point, I wanted to ask if uh, Ruth Berlin, who is the executive director of the Maryland Pesticide Education Network could present first. Thank you, Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Delegate Ruth. Am I on? Yep. Okay. You are. Great. So um, the Maryland Pesticide Education Network has been around since 1994, and we facilitate the Smart on Pesticides Coalition. We're 109 organizations and businesses that advance policies and laws that protect Marylanders from hazardous pesticides and promote safer alternatives. And we're promoting passage of this important bill that Delegate Ruth and Senator Kagan are sponsoring that corrects a very serious long-term problem by moving authority to regulate pesticides to the Maryland Department of the Environment. Maryland Department of Agriculture, MDA, was given oversight for pesticides at a time when their toxicity and far-reaching damage was little understood. MDA's prime directive is to promote and protect Maryland's agriculture industry, an important duty. However, MDA has no public or environmental health expertise needed to assess the risks of over 14,000 pesticides registered for use in the state. Pesticides are not just used in agriculture, they're used in our schools, daycare centers, hospitals, nursing homes, in our offices, on parks, golf courses, athletic fields, and in our homes and backyards. Given the Department of Agriculture's critical lack of expertise, it's not surprising that the agency has actually opposed all pesticide limiting laws that were passed by our General Assembly. This insufficiently, insufficiency is left it to public interest groups like ours to address the harmful impacts of pesticides. We've educated legislators and the public about the hazards, safer options, and promoting protection bills like Maryland's first in the nation laws, the Integrated Pest Management School Law passed in 1998 that protects the health of school children and staff with common sense measures. And MDA opposed a 216 law banning sales of a pollinator harming pesticide. Most recently, despite MDA's opposition, we did get the state to ban brain harming chlorpyrifos. But public interest groups can't keep filling this void. We need the expertise and oversight of our Department of the Environment to manage pesticides responsibly. To date, regulation of more than 14,000 pesticides is solely the decision of MDA's chemist. MDA collects an annual fee from the manufacturers of every pesticide the chemist registers for sales and use, providing income for the agency. Millions of pounds of these chemicals are used in our state annually. In fact, according to MDA's last voluntary pesticide use survey in 2014, 4.9 million pounds of pesticides were used, but only 7% of farmers responded to that survey. If that sampling is actually representative, pesticide use for just agriculture alone in 2014 was over 70 million pounds. There's a never growing body of research, many of you are familiar with, that shows how pesticides have serious adverse impacts on all life. They can damage our nervous systems, cause cancer, learning disabilities, autism, and reproductive and respiratory problems. And many are endocrine disruptors that damage our chromosomes, making our future generations more likely to develop cancer. And they're killing our pollinators at unprecedented rates, which actually threatens our agriculture. 
And EPA's Chesapeake Bay program says more than three quarters of the bay's tidal waters are impaired by chemicals, including pesticide runoff. Pesticide oversight needs to be conducted by MDE, whose charge actually is to protect the state's air, water, and land resources and safeguard citizens' health. It already has oversight of other toxic substances, including oversight regarding lead in our homes and radiation in hospitals. Increasingly, there are states that are going beyond EPA's registration of pesticides by restricting pesticides based on their own state's expert assessments to protect their state's residents in the environment. And oversight in those states is under the charge of a similar agency to our Department of the Environment, including in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, South Carolina, and California. It's time we used MDE's scientific and public health expertise to responsibly manage this very other dangerous category of toxic substances. If you'd like to get involved, just email me. The, I will put my email in the chat and to address what the bill actually does and how MDA will continue to play an important role along with the Department of Health is, I'm sending this back to Delegate Ruth, whose leadership on this effort we're very grateful for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. And, and I, you know, personally really appreciate all your years of work in trying to protect the state from, from these toxic pesticides. And, you know, when I started working on this, I was really surprised at, at how little we're actually doing in a sy systemic way to, to protect the health and environment of the state from pesticides. Um, and, you know, we have in in uh, recent years passed some specific bills and then we've had some other bills that didn't pass regulating specific pesticides, but we, we can't keep going with this whack-a-mole approach, you know, with specific legislation for specific pesticides. We need a systemic way to regulate pesticides. And the Department of the Environment is really the department that, that should be regulating pesticides because as Ruth explained that they, they do have that, that expertise. Um, the Maryland Department of the Agriculture um, certainly has their expertise in, in terms of the, the you know, relationship of pesticides to agriculture. And we don't, we don't want to lose that because agriculture is very important. There is also a health impact to this as well. And, and the Maryland Department of, of the Health, we want to make sure that they have impact. So, so basically, so that they have input. So basically, this bill essentially takes the most of the code, which is currently in the agriculture section and moves it to the environment section, transfers all the authority um, as well as staffing and resources um, to regulate pesticides from the Department of the Agriculture to the Department of the Environment. Um, and it does say, uh, one, one change that it makes is that it says that, that it changes the part which says the secretary um, can, can adopt regulations and regulate pesticides, it says, in collaboration with the Secretary of Health and the Secretary of Agriculture. So, you know, those, those two um, secretaries have important in, input, but it puts the Secretary of Environment really at, as the primary um, secretary responsible, the primary agency responsible. It also adds the ability to including regulations, establishing restricted uses or prohibitions of pesticides. And I was surprised that that actually wasn't even in the, the code before that, but now the Secretary of the Environment can ban pesticide or publish big regulations if this bill passes. The other change that, that the bill makes is if um, that there is currently a, a part of the, the law which says that that um, our, it, it ideally we should be um, in sync with the Environmental Protection Agency and it enables the the secretary to just basically wholesale adopt the rules and regulations of the um, the U.S. government, but um, you know, no no way for the agency to really do separate regulation. And, it, and in fact, it it makes it really a goal to keep us in sync with the the EPA. So this actually just repeals that provision. So the state will now have the authority to issue its own specific regulations, um, restrictions on, on pesticides. California does this. Um, they have a very extensive process for, um, you know, studying and regulating pesticides. And so now this gives Maryland the ability to, to do that as well. Um, and so Ruth posted her email in the chat. Um, I, I encourage everybody to, to reach out to her, reach out to me. 
Um, I've also posted a um, link where you can sign up to support any of my bills and we'll reach out with information. And if you have any specific questions, you can post them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll respond to them. Um, so the, the next bill moving on and, and I'm gonna speak first and then I'm gonna recognize uh, Samuel Jordan, president of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition. Um, so the, the Transportation Equity Act uh, was actually introduced last session. Um, it, it had huge support. The biggest issue that it had was a uh, fiscal note. Um, and we, we've really worked to bring down that, that fiscal note to try to have a better chance to pass. Um, what this does is it really um, promotes transportation equity statewide across all modes of transportation. Um, because, you know, transportation is not just a way of getting people from point A to point B, although that's a really important part of transportation. Um, transportation also uh, is economic development. Um, it, it's also um, you know, environmental justice and the environmental justice part is what we're really looking at today. Uh, but there's a lot of important benefits to transportation. And you know, historically, transportation policies have, um, you know, created disparate impact. They've been, um, uh, you know, there there has been, um, you know, inequity in in the way that they've been implemented. Not just transit, which is often built to favor um, white communities uh, and up look, higher income communities, but highways, for example, are built in ways that impact communities of color. Um, either dividing those communities or uh, putting out smog and pollution, which we know is higher in those communities of color. So um, this this bill really tries to take that that the step of putting equity front and center um, in all Maryland transportation planning. Um, it it uh, uh, um, will create equity as a goal in the Maryland transportation plan. It requires some reporting on data. It creates a commission on transportation equity, which will be an independent commission that will work with MDOT to ensure transportation equity. And it puts in place some protections when there are service changes to make sure that those service changes don't create disparate impact. Um, in, in addition to um, ensuring helping to dismantle systemic racism. It also will help to support uh, transportation of people, people with disabilities as well. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Samuel Jordan at this point, president of the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition. Um, Samuel has been working for, for many years on transportation equity. He's, um, many of you know that the, about the cancellation of the Baltimore Red Line. Um, and he has sort of single-handedly kept the, the light alive and keeping that red line going, but he's also working to promote transit equity statewide. And um, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to him at this point. Thank you so much, Delegate Ruth. And good afternoon to all of you. The Transportation Equity Act of 2022, I want to uh, share with you about six perspectives quickly. First, the act promotes an approach to equity that recommends anticipation and prevention as the better strategies when compared to recovery and correction, which have been the principal strategies in the past. Two, the bill recognizes that Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that guarantees equal access and equity in public transportation has not been enforced at the state level. For this reason, HB 0141 SB 23 is a historic breakthrough. Third, M.MTA has demonstrated the impunity state agencies enjoy when they do not comply with the Title VI provisions. M.MTA and the governor ignored the Title VI complaint BTEC filed in December 2015 and refused to be regulated. The former president halted the investigation and closed the complaint in solidarity with Governor Larry Hogan. Four, the following are examples of policies and proposals that would not have been made had the prior equity analyses requirement of HB 0141 and SB 23 been conducted. 
A, cancellation of the red line. B, the 15 month exposure of riders to derailment on the subway line in February, 2018. C, the draconian and permanent 20% racially disparate cuts in core bus service proposed in September, 2020. And D, the veto of the Transit Safety and Investment Act, TSIA, would not have occurred had Title VI prior transit equity analysis been performed. The anticipation and prevention capacity of the bill would have defended Maryland from transit dysfunction. Five, the first time ever cross-modal comparisons required in the bill would not have permitted the core bus service with its 83% black ridership to shoulder the greatest burden of the September 2020 proposed cuts. Well, there were no cuts in the seaport, airport, or the state highway administration modes, and just modest temporary cuts proposed for the MARC commuter rail service with its 65 to 70% white ridership. Six, the bill also has major implications for matters of the environment and climate change and is on the climate change legislative platform. For example, if MDOT MTA purchases zero emissions buses, but puts them in service on routes serving mostly white passengers, this bill would require rejection of any such disparate distribution of the benefits of zero emission vehicles. So support HB 0141 SB 23, contact your <coughs> legislators and representatives to support it because it's time for Maryland to take a vital step forward in the fight against race based transit policies. And the Transportation Equity Act of 2022 is a defense against inequity in climate change responses and environmental protection measures that are associated in any way with transportation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Samuel. I really appreciate all your work. Okay. so. The, uh, the final bill that I want to present today, and I did want to point out that I posted in the chat a link. Um, be in how you can. The last bill I want to present is the Gas Station Environment, Health, and Community Protection Act. Um, and so I, I am seeing how oh, I'm getting a notice my internet connection is unstable. I hope you're able to hear me. Um, anyway, um, there has been increasingly an aggressive expansion of these convenience store gas stations um, with like 16 gas pumps. Um, and, you know, this isn't a time when we shouldn't even be building new fossil fuel infrastructure. Uh, you know, we need to be moving as quickly as we can to, to zero emissions. Um, and so the if this bill looks at those, those gas stations and figures out how we can, um, I, I've been really working on this throughout the year, figuring out how we can reduce the health and environmental impact and also um, to uh, tr ease the transition to the, the zero emissions um, future. And so it's, it's pretty simple what it does. Uh, are you able to hear me? I feel like I'm hung up. We are able to hear you, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was getting messages that my con connection was unstable. So what this bill does is it requires all new gas stations to be at least a thousand feet from residential property and sensitive land uses like schools and daycare centers. Um, there, there is increasing research and increasing evidence of the environmental impact of gas stations. A lot of the focus on gas stations in the past has been on these underground storage tanks, and there's been a lot of legislation um, and, and require regulations on the underground storage tanks. So, but what's looked at less is the impact of the, the emissions, the benzene emissions and, and other chemicals that are going into the air. And also there's increasing research that when you fill up your tank and um, you know, gas dribbles onto the ground as you, as you, you know, pull out the thing or whatever, that there is an environmental impact to that that can actually um, permeate into the concrete and into the water um, and, and the air, uh, the chemicals can go into the air. So we really need to be doing more to protect people from the harmful chemicals that are in gasoline. 
So by requiring them to be at least a thousand feet from residential property and sensitive land uses, it, it protects them from these harmful chemicals. Um, it also requires any new gas stations to be at least a thousand feet from any existing gas stations. There has been some research um, that, that shows the accumulative impact from multiple gas stations located in, in the same place. And you know, these, these new mega convenience store gas stations that I'm seeing all over the state, they're always where there's another gas station. It's not like, hey, we're putting this gas station where um, there, there's really no other gas station, so there's a need. Basically, they, they locate it next, right next to existing gas stations, which first of all has a small business impact because many of these gas stations are the independent stations, small businesses, um, and, it, and it really harms them. There's one that's just a, about a mile from my house, a couple miles from my house that was located right like next to an independent station. And, and it hurts the business of those stations, but also there's a cumulative environmental impact. So we wanna make sure that any new gas stations are at least a thousand feet from other gas stations. It also is gonna facilitate the transition to zero emission vehicles by requiring all new stations to install EV charging stations for every new gas pump. So if there's 16 gas pumps, then they have to install 16 EV um, charging stations to start the transition. Now this, what this bill doesn't do anything about existing gas stations. Um, I really, that's, that's another issue and one that I think needs to really be, be looked at, um, particularly in terms of providing more financial help for independent stations, because you know, we're, we're moving to this, this you know, zero emission economy. And these independent gas stations have to find a way to transition or they're gonna be out of business in 10 years. So this bill does not address that issue, but it's something I'm interested in looking at in the long term. But this bill says, wait, we gotta really slow down what we're doing in terms of this rapid expansion of mega gas stations. And while I would like to just ban all new gas stations, there's, there's no way that that's ever gonna pass. But if we're going to have new gas stations, then we at least need to be sure that we're doing everything we can to transition to the zero emission um, future and to protect the health and environment of, of communities nearby. So again, I posted a link in the chat where you can sign up to support this bill and the other bills that I presented. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of this conference. You have done an amazing job. I know there was some technical difficulties. That happens. It's just part of it. Um, and, you know, I just really appreciate all the work that you've put into this in, in terms of, you know, helping to make sure that Maryland's environment is, is protected. So thank you so much. Thank you, Delegate Ruth. And there were some questions that came through, but your advocates are all over it and they have answered them. So again, I encourage you all to use that Q&A feature. Um, and, and thank you again, Delegate, for sharing those robust bills with us. I'm going to move on to uh, Senator Elfrith, another legislator with a 100% perfect score on Maryland LCV's environmental scorecard. Senator Elfrith is a powerhouse in the environmental legislation and in many different areas, including climate change, natural resource management, and clean water. She has been named a green champion by LCV, particularly for her work in resiliency and environmental accountability and transparency. Hot off the press, also Senator Elfrith was elected chair of the Chesapeake Bay Commission yesterday by her colleagues in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, which is um, well-deserved and much earned. So everyone, please welcome Senator Elfrith. Thank you so much for, for having me, everybody. It's so good to be here. It's quite uh, quite a way to spend our Saturday before session. I, I am getting particularly excited about all the work uh, my colleagues and certainly the advocacy community have uh, going on. And I want to just take a moment and thank the advocacy community for being here and being with us. I've only been in the Senate for three years, but uh, I feel like we've had quite a good term thus far for the environment. And that would not have been possible without the folks in this webinar. So I just want to take a moment and thank you. And of course, progress ahead for this next session. Being an election year, it's going to be tough to get these priorities through but we won't be able to do that without you. So I wanna thank you. I'm gonna speak about two bills today, but before I do, I know Delegate Lukey mentioned our State Parks Investment Commission work. I'm not sure if he dropped the report in the chat, but I'm gonna do that right now. Um, so folks can check out our report. It has 40 recommendations um, and we are 
very busy right now translating those recommendations into both policy and budget. I, I'm not allowed to give out the number today, but as Delegate Lukey said, it will be um, the single greatest one-time investment in our park system. Um, and to achieve many things, accessibility, transportation, transit to parks, um, and important to this group in particular, uh, increased public water access and um, an investment in green and blue infrastructure to make sure that we are overlaying our work in our public parks with our 2025 WIP goals as well. So very exciting on the state parks front and as Delegate Lukey mentioned on the land preservation front. Uh, the two bills I'm gonna be speaking about today though, a uh, very different policy area uh, and not one that I typically get into. It doesn't normally come to my committee, but solar policy. It does come to my committee budget and tax when it deals with the tax code. And so we found this nice niche uh, here. Um, this group was so instrumental in helping the legislature pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act in 2019, setting the goal to get to 50% renewable energy by 2030, and then 100% thereafter. Um, but one of the kind of in retrospect things we might have been able to do better is help set the roadmap for how to achieve that, particularly around solar. And as this group also knows, um, we need to do a better job incentivizing rooftop solar and particularly in communities and to benefit communities that frankly need it the most. So that's kind of the space that this bill is in. I am so proud to be partnering with Delegate Stephanie Smith and Senator Corey McRae, uh, both from Baltimore City. This is about how do we incentivize using the tax code, more rooftop solar on multi-housing affordable uh, affordable multi-housing units. Um, Baltimore City has a significant uh, population of affordable housing, and so does my district in Annapolis. We actually have the second largest population of public housing in the state, and we need to be doing a better job as we are strategically um, rehabbing or redeveloping that affordable housing, that we are also thinking green and in a way that's going to benefit the folks who are gonna be living in those communities. So that's this bill, a <laughs> long story to get here, but the community solar energy generating system exemption from energy and property taxes. We all know uh, rooftop solar is uh, more expensive to build than uh, putting it on ag land. So how do, and particularly um, on affordable housing units where the margins are already so small, we need to use our tax code to incentivize that. So that's what the bill does. It exempts projects from county or municipal personal property taxes um, for those community solar projects installed on rooftops, parking lots, roadways, and brownfields but they have to benefit the low to moderate income households, um, whether it's on, on that roof or nearby. Um, it encourages solar generation and communities that are burdened by environmental pollutants and helps provide assistance to low and moderate income households. So ensuring that the benefit is then going back to those households themselves to lower utility bills. Um, and it is also uh, overcome the greatest costs associated with the development projects. As I said, the margins are already so small. So we are currently working, um, since both of these taxes are not state related, they're municipal and county related, we are hastily working with MAKO and MML, our county executives and our mayors, to make sure that they are partners here. It's our belief that we won't be losing tax money because frankly, these projects are not going to get to be built without this proper tax incentive. So overall, it's going to help us reach our 2030 renewable energy goals, but also ensuring that uh, that renewable energy is in fact benefiting the communities that need it the most. And with that, I can turn it over to Kristen Harbison from LCV, who is uh, one of our lead partners on this bill. Kristen. Thank you, Senator. And thanks again to everybody who organized this. Um, Senator, when you said that you'd only been in the Senate for three years, of course, I know that, but it made me stop a second because for the work that you've done in three years um, is staggering. So thank you for all your your tremendous work. Um, and, and the center gave all the high points of this bill, which is a priority of Maryland LCB. We work at the intersection of climate change and environmental justice, and this bill hits right in that sweet spot. Um, we do have a House bill hearing scheduled on uh, January 19th, so coming up very quickly. I will put my email in the chat um, so that if anybody who wants to get involved or uh, find out more information can reach out to me and get engaged um, when it, because it's coming up really quickly. And again, thank you so much. This is a really important bill and we're grateful for um, all of our sponsors. And back to you, Senator. Thank you, Kristen. And just to be clear, the, the 
the, the pre-file uh, was dropped in the house, uh, Delegate Smith dropped in the house, so it, I will put a link to the, the bill text in the chat, and so that hearing has been scheduled. Uh, we have not filed it yet in the Senate, but plan to do that the first week of session, so stay tuned for the Senate bill number, and of course we would love your help. Um, moving on to oysters, we've, we've talked about a variety of policy issues uh, today already, but we haven't really touched um, fisheries or, or, or natural resources. So I'm excited to change things up today. Um, I have uh, been working on oyster policy uh, really since I got to the Senate. Before I got to the Senate, a group of constituents came to me um, in that gray period between being elected and being sworn in, um, really wanting to work on oyster policy. And I have so many great partners in this work from CBF to uh, Arundel Rivers Federation, shout out to our river keepers for all their help in this, uh, across the board. So the first year I was in the Senate, we passed a bill, uh, two major oyster bills, as folks may recall, one putting um, five of the larger oyster sanctuaries, the tributaries as we refer to them, into permanent sanctuary status. So that has been moving along well. Um, there's a bit of a hiccup in the Minokin for folks on the shore. I'm sure you know about all about that. Um, and the bill, so that the tributary bill passed in 2019, thankfully, and then we passed uh, a revised Oyster Advisory Commission. That's entire goal was to bring watermen and advocates together, um, have scientists be the moderators to figure out where we could agree and where we could build consensus. Uh, unfortunately, that process started right before the pandemic. Um, being in, physically in the same room together was a key piece of that success. Unfortunately, that couldn't happen during the pandemic. There was also some external uh, political divisions that were being fueled at that time. So I'm I, you know, a lot of reasons why the output or outcome of the OAC process, I think wasn't what we all intended from the start. But there were some places of consensus, and that is our goal with this bill. How do we build off the, the pieces where the advocates, the scientists, and the watermen in the industry all agree uh, on. So thus we have an omnibus oyster sh shell and spat bill. It should also say spat. Um, we can all agree that we need more, we need more supply. We're around 1% of historic oyster population levels, perhaps 2% depending, um, but we have a lot further to go. Another key component of the work of the OAC was that if we were to stop everything tomorrow, um, have a moratorium on wild harvest, we have um, taken this industry to such a, a, the fishery to such a point where it is not going to rebound naturally. It is just not possible because of the pressures we've put on the fishery itself. So we need greater inputs, we need greater supply. And that's where this bill comes in. So some of the highlights are going to be overall, we're going to increase our spat production, those are baby oysters, um, to 5 billion by 2025. We're producing, hovering around 2 billion a year right now between a couple of hatcheries around the state, the largest one being Horn Point uh, on the shore. So we're gonna increase our SPAC uh, production um, two and a half fold by, by 2025 by providing key capital support to hatcheries across the state. We are going to reconfigure the restaurant shell recycling tax credit that we have in place that so many restaurants in my district and across the state take advantage of. But as I'm sure uh, if you speak to any of those restaurateurs, none of them are doing it for the money. They're doing it uh, because they know it's the right thing to recycle that shell. So it's going, the, the tax credit is going to sunset in 2023. It's now the proper time to, for us to rethink that, how we can better incentivize and at least better support the restaurants that do take advantage of, of that program. And how do we increase the capturing of that shell so that we can then put it back into uh, our efforts to restore the population. Um, we're going to fund a joint substrate research program through UMSIS, that's the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Studies, CERC, which is in my district, the Smithsonian, uh, and VIMS in Virginia. Uh, there are is quite a bit of point of contention on substrate, uh, and we uh, know each of those groups and many others have done significant research in this space. We want to bring everybody together to find out what grade of substrate, what components, um, the 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 height in a water column, what is kind of the magic uh, formula here for this to be most effective. Um, and we're also going to hopefully fund a new Bay Bottom Survey. Folks on this call, I'm, I'm sure know, but the general public might not, that we are using maps of oyster beds from the 1970s. And in some cases, we are using Yates maps from the 1920s. 
but we have not done a bay bottom survey since the 1970s, meaning our um, knowledge of this fishery and, and at least the habitat is 50 years old. So we are working to partner with NOAA and partner with the state of Virginia to fund a new bay bottom survey so we can better understand the challenges ahead. And then lastly, um, their good news is that shucking houses are starting to come back. And there's a few that are looking to open up on the Eastern shore. And we wanna provide some financial tax incentives um, to help them open up uh, as long as we can then reclaim that shell and use it for our restoration efforts. So omnibus oyster spat and shell bill. I'm really proud to be working with delegate Brian Crosby from Southern Maryland on that bill and also actively partnering with our friends on the Eastern shore. I saw my, my dear colleague, Senator Addie Eckert was on this call earlier today and she's just such a, a, a wonderful partner to work with this uh, on this policy area with and I wanna thank Addie for her, for her cooperation. Um, and with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you, Senator. I, you know, thank you so much for your work that you've done for oysters. Obviously, it's huge here for the Eastern Shore, especially considering the Chop Tank has three of the five largest scale oyster restoration projects. Um, so as, as a riverkeeper, you know, it, that's huge for me. I appreciate it. Uh, we did have one question. Is there any data on PFAs or hmm. the forever chemical in our oysters? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question and another uh, issue area I've been working on and I believe Delegate Love will be here tomorrow to talk about PFAS. We have a separate PFAS bill, uh, but that has been a concern. So MDE conducted a study of, I, I deal, I'm on the budget committee, so forgive me, I deal in a lot of numbers. I believe it was around 180 drinking water sites, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, and also looked at the presence uh, for PFAS and looked at the presence in oysters and they did come out with a report i'm happy to dig around and try to post it in the chat today um, where pfas were found in oysters of course we know they are forever chemicals who bioaccumulate and um, are in our food cycle so i will try to find that report and drop it in yeah certainly something that's coming up more and more in this clean water discussion and and as senator elford said we will be discussing the pfa legislation tomorrow so i can also follow up and put some of the that information in the chat for everyone tomorrow thank you senator thank you okay we're coming up to our last legislator of the evening delegate henson her environmental platform pushes for the use of clean and renewable energy water quality regulations and air air quality standards that sustain healthy communities she successfully championed legislation last year that will update and modernize the state's stormwater management plans and watershed implementation plans, a huge win for the environment and our Chesapeake Bay. And continuing along here with our theme of strong, incredible women, on top of all that incredible work in the house and with all of her free time, Delegate Henson founded a law firm in Annapolis in 2020 where she is currently the lead attorney. Uh, everyone, please welcome Delegate Henson. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you for the warm welcome and the warm introduction. And thank you to everyone who has stayed on the line to hear about all of these amazing priorities and this great legislation that we'll be taking on soon enough. Um, thanks to the Climate Justice Wing and Sierra Club, all the advocates, all of my colleagues that are on for prioritizing this time today for us to talk about this. Um, I wanna highlight one bill that I have coming up this session. I have Robin Clark, who's here from CBF as well. And when Robin and I started on this journey, we started by listening to small and urban farmers to figure out what it was that they needed, what we could do to, to support the work that they're doing. We know that when we can preserve green space in our urban areas, that it definitely has its benefits. When we can reduce that impervious surface and development of those areas, we can have a host of benefits. And then when we can add to that, supporting the local economy, it just has a tremendous impact. So when we started out listening to our small and urban farmers, they highlighted for us some key challenges that they've had that presented us with some opportunities to tackle it with legislation. One of the challenges is that a lot of our programs simply are not designed, they were not tailored for small and urban farms. So when you're trying to compete and be eligible and get grant funding for programs that include cost sharing support for conservation, um, it's hard to do that sometimes when the area that you're passionate about and you're working in is a smaller urban farm. One of the other things they highlighted for us is that some of the minimal animal requirements and minimum acreage requirements create barriers to eligibility for them. 
Another area that they highlighted as well is that a lot of the practices that are included in urban farming, such as the use of greenhouses, um, high tunnel systems, and then also the security systems that you might need when you think of an urban farm that's in an area that's highly populated, those things aren't envisioned in the funding that we have to support our farmers. Another thing that they also highlighted for us is that the mentorship and the training, the, you know, the food safety practices, the organic certifications, bookkeepings, navigating all the local laws and regulations is something that's difficult to do when you're a small farmer and you're working on a very narrow budget. So that type of technical support was highlighted as something that would be really valuable to creating this space and continuing to see it grow. Uh, one of the things that my colleague who was on earlier, Delegate Charcutian, spent a great deal of time working on in the interim was our food security council that they had to look at what we can do to really make sure we eliminate food deserts and we bring different options to people. And one of the things that our small and urban farmers highlighted for us is that the support that's needed for aggregating uh, food distributions, making sure that they have marketing and all the materials and supplies that they would need to be able to take their food from farm to table. So when we looked at all of the challenges that were presented, we thought, wow, these are great opportunities for us to jump in and revamp some of our existing programs. Some of the work that was started by my colleague delegate Melissa Wells last session to bring urban farming support to Baltimore City, we want to be able to open that up and see where we can support other areas in the state of Maryland. So I know for me, when I came to this work, it um it felt like a really appropriate time to be able to tackle something like this. For my family, my mom, she spent her whole career at the USDA and working on behalf of farmers. You know, she was spent her career there in the Civil Rights Division at USDA, and she recently retired. So she told me that she was passing the baton on making sure that we had opportunities like this and programs that were robust in, robust in supporting our small and urban farmers. So I'm so happy to team up with Robin and to uh, put this legislation forward that can really make a huge impact. Robin, if you're on, would you mind walking through some of the aspects of the bill? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Delegate. Thank you for your leadership in this area. Um, as Delegate mentioned, uh, uh, there have been several legislators working in this sector, and we're so pleased to see that and look forward to working alongside them this year. Um, Senator McRae had in a bill last year to do with Baltimore City Soil Conservation District, and Delegate Wells has been part of the conversation too. So um, legislation that we'll look at this year could, um, could run across a variety of of vehicles and, and different approaches, both opening up the Maryland Department of Agriculture's Water Quality Cost Share Program, which provides over $20 million from its cover crop program and its capital program yearly to farmers, trying to open that up so that urban farms, smaller operations with less than eight animals and less than five acres would be eligible for cost share that ranges from 87.5% up to 100% of the state paying for, for certain practices. And then also trying to figure out funding for new programs that would allow these, these practices and, and aspects particular to urban farming to be supported by the state. Um, the delegate mentioned security, water irrigation, metering at the site, and the use of high tunnel systems um, or hoop houses. Um, some of these practices are eligible for funding at the federal level, but not here in Maryland. And, you know, I'm sure those on the call have experienced some of the trends that we've seen, especially during the COVID crisis. And the delegate mentioned the Food Resiliency Council. And in, in a way, this, this meshes with that, that the popularity of farmers markets and CSAs has been through the roof. Um, and thinking about how we can close the, the supply chain, um, keeping Maryland produce here in Maryland, trying to address some of the fresh food um, shortages and food priority areas that we have at the same time as we reduce the greenhouse gases used to transport food um, from farm to table. So there's a lot of wonderful possibility here. Um, just to reiterate again, the, the, the technical sides of this would be to open up some existing programs like through the Department of Agriculture, also the University of Maryland's Extension Agriculture Agents. They just weren't traditionally coming with a background 
from uh, of urban agriculture. But if we could get one or two agents that were geared um, entirely towards that practice, that could really help with some of the training needs that we're hearing from farmers and farm service providers throughout Maryland. Everything from how to do bookkeeping um, to how to how to clean produce such that it's acceptable. Um, uh, from a food safety standpoint and, and for organic certification um, to marketing and, um, and other, um, uh, oh, just navigating local laws and regulations that you need um, to, both from the business end and from the farm production end. So I'm hoping to, to do some of that work through this legislation this year. And they'll all they'll likely be more <laughs> to come in future years. But it's wonderful that we have the opportunity here in the growth area and want to want to put these farms on equal footing with regard to state support um, to show that it's it's such a wonderful trend both environmentally and for um, our e economically and to strengthen the the fabric of our communities. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate it. And thanks for your collaboration and support on this bill. Elle, that's all that I have for the bill. If we want to open it up to any questions, I'd certainly be happy. Yes, thank you, Delegate. We do have one question. Um, is there a consideration of size for what qualifies as a small farm or an urban farm? I'll let Robin jump in if you want to. Um, we haven't put those those types of parameters with regard to urban farm. We're looking at farms that operate within sense, urban census blocks and serve urban census blocks. And we might try to, to create preferences for those farms that plan to, to provide um, produce to food priorities in Maryland as they've been mapped by um, Center for Livable Futures or University of Maryland. Thank you, Robin. And, and thank you again, Delegate Henson, for sharing this legislation and bringing it uh, much needed legislation. And I want to thank all of our legislators who joined us today, all of our advocates who joined us today. I apologize for any technical difficulties that you may have. Um, and I want to point out that now in the chat, there is a link to the Zoom for tomorrow. Um, the, the passcode is actually built into that link. So all you need is that link. And that should also hopefully be sent out to you. Um, Regardless, we will be sending the full recording and the chat um, and anything that the, the legislator shared with you all into uh, your emails so that you have a copy of it. It looks like we have no open questions, which is fantastic. So thank you again to those advocates who have been answering diligently um, as our legislators has been speaking. So. Um, with that, I hope you all are energized. I hope you're inspired. I know I am. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. A reminder that tomorrow is all new bills, um, all new speakers. So we can be excited uh, to, to start fresh tomorrow. So thank you all again. And if you have any follow up questions, feel free to put them in the chat now. We can save them for tomorrow. But otherwise, we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for a great evening. <laughs>